Welcome to the Nerd Tutorial Podcast, a podcast offering discussions and tutorials on nerdy subjects for people who aren't necessarily nerdy themselves. With you today is myself, your nerdy tutor George, and with me here today, Jedi Hopeful, my mom. I, I want to be Ray. You could be Ray. You could be Ray. She's very, she's very, I actually got some cool facts about Ray, actually. So. Okay, cool. Um, so, we are continuing our discussion on Star Wars with the eventual, um, if by this point, if you're listening to the podcast, the movie's already been released. Um, I have watched it, but we'll avoid any spoilers talks, and we'll do our spoiler And discussion. the movie being Star Wars 9. The ninth movie, Rise of the Skywalker. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we'll have our spoiler-free episode next time you hear from us here next week. But today we're going to start with the 7 and 8 film, and we're also going to review uh, Solo, a, a Star Wars story, because it's kind of the Han Solo uh, bit here. So I wanted to actually start off with Han Solo. Because it's a kind of in-betweener movie that's really kind of meant to take place between episodes three and four, kind of like this time in the um, in the Jedi in the Star Wars canon or lore that not a lot of stuff has happened or a lot of discussion has really happened around that time frame, like what really happened. Okay, so so, so if you were to look at the the sort of um, side movies mm-hmm. that have been made, which ones are the ones you really think are were necessary? I don't think any of them are necessary. Okay. But I but that doesn't diminish from the point that they are fun to have. They are fun to have. They are fun to have. Um, I, I think I think the most substantial one is probably Rogue One, if only just because it feels substantial at the end of the day. It feels as though it's like because it leads right into the very next movie, so it feels more substantial than it really than it really does. But I didn't need to know about the Rogue One story at the end of the day. But I'm so, glad that I did. Yeah, yeah. So um, I saw Rogue, Rogue One before watching... Um, Four, five, and six. Six for the second time. Because I'd seen them all the first time. Mm-hmm. I hadn't seen one, two, and three. Okay. But I but had seen um, four, five, and six when they when they originally came out. Mm-hmm. And, and several times in between because I have you. And we had them at home. Yes. So um, so Rogue One, I thought, was, uh, was a nice sort of, this is how they got the plans. Mm-hmm. And... And this is what the resistance was kind of for. Um, I also like how that one kind of shows how bad the Empire is. Because while you get the impression that, like, the Empire is a bad guy in the third, in the in the fourth film here, like, you don't, I mean, like, for all you know, the Rebels could just actually be, like, insurgents in some sort of way. Well, and I still have holes in that story. Like, like I know I'm, I know I'm on the rebel side, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm not really sure why. I mean, I can so, explain why. Because, well, well, okay. So, what's what's so evil? Are they, they're going to kill people and torture them. And fine, I get that. But what's so evil about the empire? Again, that's what Rogue. One, I think Rogue One helps out with that. It does some. It I, th- does I some. think I think it does kind of point paint. Um, it, I I think if you were to watch Rogue One first, then go watch four, five, and six. You would get that this world is in a very kind of gritty place, and there's this rough and double sort of. That stuff at some happened. point the Senate really did work. We, but I, I think what's I think what's missing for me is we never in in any of the movies that I've seen thus far get a time when the Senate worked in a way where where it the was galaxy, intended. yeah, where the galaxy really was a democracy. Yeah. So we never ever actually have that, and no. the closest you get to it is maybe the first movie. Yeah. Okay. Again, which I, is the fourth fan, movie. Yeah, Phantom yeah. Menace. Phantom Menace. But I like Rogue One because, again, it naturally leads into it. And it, 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 I, it, I almost imagine if you had watched, if you hadn't watched Star Wars before, watching Rogue One, you, when Vader comes on the scene in first comes on the scene in Episode Four, you're like, I know that guy. He's a badass. Not to f with that guy. That guy is, you know, like. Oh yeah, because the final scene in Rogue One, just, yeah. Or okay. Yeah. So, so my whole reason for bringing that up is, is, okay. So Solo fills in a lot of holes. Freaking love Some it. some holes, yes. Fills in some holes. I'm not really sure I needed them filled. No. And and it's a little too, um, perfect puzzle piece for me. Yes. And the, this is often the problem with prequels in a lot of cases because. You have this foundation that you have to eventually, f- that you have eventually have to put the pieces into place, to in order to be able to get when you get to the foundation to build on top of the foundation that was already there. Um, so again, sometimes prequels are not a good thing in some cases because they paint too much of what happens in the middle, and 
again, it's often the syndrome I find of time that if you're a nerd and you've had a lot of time to think about what you think something should be, you, unless it hits it immediately out of the park like the Marvel movies did, like everyone knew what the Marvel movies were, but the Marvel movies did a good job of like, saying, we're going to rely on the source material for our They're direction. Authentic. Yeah. And everyone can watch those movies and, and say like, oh yeah, this is not exactly like Civil War, but it's, an, but it's literally the point of Civil War at the end of yeah. the day. Okay, so before I go into into my 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 um, comments, yes, comments. Do you want to talk about what 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 it? So so yeah, so let's just break down Han, the solo solo a Star Wars movie, and I apologize ahead if I would call it Han Solo the Star Wars movie because I still think it's just Han Solo. I think Solo is just too simple. Um, so basically, Han Solo and his girlfriend K- K- Kira, Kira, I love. it. Now, mind you, when they spell it in in the in the novelization, it's Q I R A. Yeah, Q apostrophe I R A. Yeah. N- what was the problem with K I R A? Seriously. Because it's not nightly. I know. Okay. So Han Solo and Kira are like orphans who are like in this like ragtag sort of gang sort of thing. It's kind of like out of like Oliver Twist almost. Nice, nice analogy. Yeah. Um, it works. Oliver Twist. After the initial orphanage. Yeah. Um, and they get, like, a little bit of this, like, super uh, hyperspace fuel. And they're trying to buy their way off of the Corellia, which is this planet where they build all these cool starships By at. selling it to... By sell- but using it to bribe their way through the Empire Gate. Yeah. Um, Han Solo gets through the gate, but Kira doesn't. So Han Solo runs... Because Kira tells him to run, she goes back and she goes back and. But he promises he's going to come back. He for promises her. he's going to come back for her. Yes, and the way he figures out to do that is he's going to enlist with the, uh, with the Empire and become a pilot, so that way he can become a, he can get his own ship one day. Yeah. Um, and actually, what's actually I find interesting is that um, he's really just Han, not Han Solo. He goes to get his. He gets to go. He, he goes, I goes was going to gonna talk. That's one of my complaints. Actually. Oh, the, that they that they registered him as Han Solo because he's just a single guy with him. He's just a single guy, and he has no last name, so he's alone. So he's solo. Yeah, I know. Again, a little too perfect on on the button. Yeah. Um, we fast forward probably like three or four years, and um, at this point here, Han Solo's actually been kicked out of flight school because he's been in, he's, insubordinate and yeah. he's now just an infantry grunt apparently yep um and what he believes is a very much a losing fight on this mud world that they're on yeah um he meets beckett and his kind of ragtag crew of criminals that are there to steal and uh, beckett is played by woody harrelson i loved him so much as a, as, as a, a zombie fighter did you like him in this role i did because he's very roguish he is very roguish. Um, this is also so. Basically, Han Solo goes to them and is like, "Hey, like." You it guys... reminded me of though of the role he plays in, in, in Zombie Land. Land. Yeah. yeah, very much kind of like this cocky kind of like, "Yeah, I got this, whatever." Yeah, yeah. Um, it, very Han... much the same. Yeah. So Han Solo is actually trying to like he talks to the criminals. Is like, "Hey, like, let me go with you guys. Like I, this, this, this Imperial goody guy stuff. You know, this, this is not me. Let me, let me yeah. join up with you guys. Like, no, we don't want you." And then he literally tries to go wrath them out. It's like, but mind you, like the criminals are wearing, like L- Harrison or Woody Harrelson here is literally wearing a like lieutenant's outfit right now. Yeah. And and he just swaggers in and he's like, this man is a liar and a traitor. Go lock him up. And everyone's like, yeah, lock him up. How dare you speak against this lieutenant? Yeah. Um, this is the and now this is the famous scene where he meets Chewbacca, and I didn't like this scene. Well, I was gonna okay. So I'll save my comment for the end. I, he's supposed to, he's, oh, he's like basically fed to Chewbacca. Yeah, this is my this is my initial problem. Like I can, I can appreciate it. Like the like two, I mean literally like fed to him. Yeah, with the intention of being eaten. Yes, but Wookies don't eat people. They'll rip your arms off, but they like, which is a, a a known sort of thing. We've never seen a Wookiee who actually rip arms off of anybody, although that's the claim that they do. But they don't eat people. Just, that's not what Wookiees do. <laughs> it, well, I mean, my, my thing is, if, if Wookiees really were um, something that, that would eat people on command, um, I mean, kind of. Almost on, yeah, kind of on command on a certain level. Yeah. So, so um, if, if, then, then why would you let them 
join anybody. I mean, why would they be? Why would, because why, they're, they have tremendous strength. I get it, but but why would they ever? Why why would they not just be caged animals? And why would they not be treated like people otherwise? Right. Yeah. Again, my 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 entire point is entirely too. Like my, I I really kind of. I wish it was a different way they met because at the end of the day here, like, they become friends by force, which is kind of what I wanted. I wanted them to become friends by force, like, but like a mutual well, I wouldn't force. Even say, okay, so I wouldn't even, okay. Well, you finish the storyline and then okay. I'll give you my thoughts. I'm sorry. So um, eventually they get out of there because I guess for whatever reason, Han Solo can speak Kashyyyk, which is the language of the Wookiees, the roars and the grunts. He can understand it. Excuse me, what the F, where does that come from? Good question. Must have must have been, you know, somewhere back in before the story even started, his parents lived there or something. He's an orphan. Like if there was like another Wookiee like amongst the other the other brats on Corellia, that would make sense then. But yeah. we never saw another yeah. Wookiee with them them at all. And you could have had a Wookiee in the orphanage. Now mind you, as a tangent here, the original version of the story the original kind of version that a lot of people understood the where Han Solo came from is that his parents were a part of the Republic, and they were on Kashyyyk as kind of ambassadors to the planet, which is how Han would have learned the Kashyyyk, would have learned the language. Yeah. In the process of Order 66, Han Solo would have been like maybe like 10 years old when this happened. And Order 66 being the order in which all the Jedi must die. Yeah. That his parents got killed by the clone troopers because they were like, no, you can't kill the Jedi, and they killed them. the parents as a, kind of a collateral damage at the end of the day, and... Han Solo escapes, and he meets Chewbacca. He meets Chewbacca for a little bit, they disappear, and then they eventually come back together. Or they were together at the same time. Who knows? Like, they escaped together off the planet, and were thankfully, they were thankful to both get off the planet. Yeah. Which would make, which would make sense how he knows the language. I'd even go with, okay, so finish the storyline, and then I'll tell you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they eventually escape. The intention is that the reason they were on this ugly world was to get a, an imperial ship which was meant to kind of be like a cargo ship right and their intent is they're supposed to steal this hyperspace uh, super fuel uh, coaxium is what it's called right. so they're doing the job and the job goes wrong because these pirates come and they decide no we want this stuff as well yeah um, it ends up like self detonating it's Beckett's crew though yeah but most of Beckett's crew ends up dying with the exception of Chewie and Han at this point and Beckett basically explains that, like, no, you know, uh, this Desert Sun, which, if, if memory serves me, yeah. is the correct. So, Desert Sun is a super gang and you know, galaxy gang, essentially. Uh, named, uh, in this case, in this particular field, in this particular, like, branch of it, I think, is led by a guy named uh, Dryden Voss. Right. Um, oh God, what was, the guy, what was this guy's name? Um, I love this guy because he also plays. Um, uh, not Ultron, but he plays um, the other guy in, in in the Marvel movies, in Infinity War and uh, Age of Ultron. Um, the green and red guy. Oh. Um, yeah, not no, Bentley, I mean. but uh, yeah, I can't remember his yeah. name off the top of my head. I'm sure I'll fill it in later. I apologize. Um, who's like got scars on his face? Like apparently, this is the guy who told um, Beckett, who was Woody Harrelson's character, to go and. <laughs> To go do this job to pay off some sort of debt. There are lots of debts to be paid here. Yes. Um, and Han Solo's like, no, I'll go with you and we'll make sure that you get your debt paid. We'll find we'll find a way around this. And Woody Harrelson kind of like, no, kid, like this is my thing. I got to go deal with this. But, Woody, but Han Solo's like, no, we, we screwed up as well. We, we're going to make sure that you don't get further in debt. Like Han Solo's still trying to be a good guy at the end of the day. See, and here's why it wasn't clear. Is this the debt that he ends up owing Jabba the Hutt? No. Because that isn't clear. No, not no, not the debt that it's owned to Job of the Hut, but that but that's hinted at the very end of the movie. I never get, I never, I I, I intended to come away because I always have goals when I when I start the movie. Mm. I try to think at least for this series while we've been doing this. What do you want to know and get what, from? What what do I what what am I hoping to get? And one of the things I was hoping to get was what was the debt to Job of the Hut? And I did I miss that? Well, there was it was never brought up. Why? You don't have any other opportunity to bring it up. This is his entire... Sequel opportunity. The yeah, actor is... No, because this goes almost directly into, no, into it New Hope. No, it doesn't. It doesn't? No. No, I mean, 
You can. I mean, he's got the Falcon. He gets the Falcon. I can almost. You can almost paint it that like an extra like five years later, because again, this would be like Han Solo when he was like. 22, 23 years old, maybe. Well, then how old is he in New Hope? Because I, I would say I, I would. I was always say I was always under the impression he was like 29, 30 years old, maybe like in his very like just about to be thirty or very early thirties. Because that would give the because again, like Harrison Ford would be of that age at the time. You'd have that kind of you know mystique about knowing the universe at that point. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So let's back up to Harrison okay. Ford because because he he just got done playing American Graffiti. Mm-hmm. When he did Star Wars, there's not yeah. there's like three years between the two. Yeah, but in American he... Graffiti, he plays like a a nineteen year old. Yeah, but he was always like twenty five, twenty six years old when he did American Graffiti. Okay, and that's oh. I mean like if you look back in time, I'll go like... with it. I was I was disappointed because I thought I would like to understand. You would like to understand that nod and where the where those kind of stuff comes from. Because and, just... and then and then and, and okay, I don't want to interfere. Okay, well, I'm sorry. Let's go a little bit further in. So. Um, and this is also where in this this like traveling like casino bar sort of thing, which is kind of cool actually. Yeah. Um, is also Kira apparently who works for the Rising Sun. She works for the evil the evil uh, the evil gang. gang yeah, and she's like, no, Han Solo can do it. I trust Han Solo, and so they all get together and they decide, okay, mm-hmm. well we're gonna go get. The Ke- we're going to go to a place called Kessel where the Empire already makes mines Coaxium and we'll get the Coaxium from there. A little like going to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, kind of. Um, but in order to do that, they need a good ship to do it. And so they're going to go and recruit Lando Calrissian. And God, Sabak is such a weird game. It's like poker, but not. So, so in order to kind of convince Lando Calrissian to like part with the Millennium Falcon, Falcon. Um, Han Solo pretends that he's going to sell his own ship, which is another kind of like really fast and nice ship, but not as nice yeah. as the Millennium Falcon, apparently. And this giant kind of card game kind of happens like over the course of like five minutes, but it feels like it lasts like the whole night yeah. almost. Yeah, it, it seems which, like it must be 10 but it, hours. Yeah, but it's like, but it's like, it's well done at the end of the day. It's, I, it's I like, well I like that card game. Do you want to talk about who the director of this thing was? It's Ron Howard. Yeah. Ron Howard does good stuff at the yeah, end of the day. I don't he think does. This, I don't think this is his best, but I think this was still well, good. Well, it's kind of an off topic for him. It really is. Like science fiction was is not one of his better things here. I still love Apollo thirteen. I will. You 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 tell me Apollo thirteen's on TBS, and I'll watch TBS, and I oh, hate TBS. No, and I'm t- you know he no he's done. I love Cocoon. I mean I, he's done a number of really really good movies. Oh yeah, absolutely. This, and is, this is outside of his, this is outside of his wheelhouse, though. It is, but for all that, I thought. Um, it's well paced. Yes, it was very well paced. I, I have I have problems with storyline in a couple places, but it's well paced and actually I I thought the direction it was quite good. Yeah, the argument I've heard about this film is that if you remember, if you turn off your brain and remember, it's not a Star Wars movie; it's just a space thing happening. Yeah. Then it then it's a little bit better. But the second you remind yourself, oh yeah, it's a Star Wars. You have to remind people of this, this, and this, and this is this comes from here. And oh my goodness, so what you like? It becomes less entertaining on a certain level because you're thinking. Because in your I case, I was entertained. No, no, not to say it wasn't entertained, but your brain is thinking about where is this? What about this? Stuff like that. Yeah. So um, we also get one of my favorite characters here, which is L three three seven. Not for long. Not for long, but again, like you, do you notice who she's played by? Brienne of Tarth. Oh, I love Brienne of Tarth. Yes, and she actually is also in the later movies as well here. Oh, okay. seven and eight. She is Captain Phasma. That is true. Yes. That is true. So, um, I don't know why I didn't make that connection. Gwendolyn, uh, something with a D. She's well known for being Brienne of Tarth, Tarth yeah. from Lord of the Ring, or from uh, excuse me, Game of Thrones. Which, again, I mean, like she's like the six foot five, like oh, she's mostly muscular, almost she is, like ugh. She, yeah, no, no, no. She's she's totally badass. Oh, absolutely. So, um, so they agree that you know so. It, Han loses this game initially, but only because Lando cheated at the end of the day. Right. Um, but they still convince Lando to like help them out. Um, to get to Castle is is kind of tricky because there's this narrow corridor that's been charted. Mm-hmm. The surrounding space around it. Well, is... has anybody else ever been through it? Well, no, no. The the chart to, the, the path to get through to Kessel is literally be- has beacons on it, so you can travel through, through it. it. Okay, and that's how you get to Kessel back and forth. But this is kind of like the only known way to go through it because 
all the space around it is mostly uncharted it's and very dangerous and like like being in like a typhoon like being yeah. in the middle of a hurricane yeah so like there's this narrow space you can get through to get to it they get they get there they they do the job essentially at the end of the day um L337's got this thing about, like, droids being free. So, like, she starts a mutiny of other free droids. Um, she gets kind of hurt at the end of the day, and they end up merging her with the ship. Which is why, which, then I, I can explain the exact reason why that's the case. Because if you look back to Empire Strike Back, uh -huh. there's a line in the, in the ship, and there's a line in the series where C-3PO is communicating with the computer... Uh -huh. And he literally says, well, I don't know where your computer learned to talk, but it says this, this, and this. It's because L337 is now part of the computer, computer. Okay. and she's kind of infected it with her I thought, personality. I thought it was kind of cool, actually, that, that that's what happened, so yeah. she doesn't die. No, but her... her the, the only reason she's Lando... She's no longer a droid, but she doesn't die. No, and, and Lando has her mostly because she has the best navigational star charts anywhere. Yeah. So... Even if they lost the Millennium Falcon, they'd still have amazing star charts. Yeah. So, um, so they they get their thing. They get the coaxium. Chewie's able to stay to liberate some Wookies, and they start this huge riot there. They're about to leave, but then suddenly the Empire's right there at the front. They're like, "Hold on, hold on, you're coming from Kessel. We want to take a look at whatever you. We want to take a look what, at your stuff. Wait, where's your cargo? Yeah, what's your cargo? And they're basically like, "Well, if we show them coaxium, like we're not getting out of this." Um, and so basically, um, they decide to go through the nebula. Yeah. Um, and Lando's actually, I think, um, who, who has just lost his, his droid here is kind of like pouting about it. So yeah. it's actually Han Solo piloting the Millennium Falcon really yeah. for the first time with Chewie, oddly enough. Yeah. Where did the... Okay. I, I have, I have so, questions. You so go the, ahead. You go so ahead. This is where the Kessel Run comes from. Yes. Which is referred to several times in in different in different contexts throughout but, the Star Wars. But lore. in the beginning of New Hope, yes, if in in the bar the, the, scene. And now, mind you, like a lot of people have a lot of. This is something I want to kind of explain a little bit better because everyone has a problem with parsecs is a leisure of distance, not time, right. not speed, so, not not speed or not time. So why do you say parse that? You, why do you measure it in distance instead of time? The logic behind it is that. Space is not even, so you can't just draw a straight line from where you want to go to from one place to another. Thus, in order to be able to chart, and the reason why you have to have navigational charts of everything, is that you avoid debris like the Kessel area, for example. Well, and also you avoid different different gravity zones that different would pull you. Planets and other stuff like yeah. that. So clearly you can't travel in a straight line, so what you end up doing is you end up traveling. Um, they measure They measure your speed, rather, as how many the shortest line you can you can take to get to yep. somewhere versus the time it took you to do it because hyperspace basically you could get in there you could go from one side of the galaxy to another within like a day or so assuming you had the shortest route possible yeah in this case here because they go through like this uncharted area that's just like full of weird gravitational eddies and right and black the nebula, holes. nebula is, is all sorts of gravitational yeah. pulls um so because they're able to kind of like jump through this area they were able to cut off some of the parsecs you would need to do for it, thus the famous Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. Six. So, I understand the logic there, and they have to have kind of a cool... You have the Millennium Falcon, why not do something cool with the Millennium Falcon, Falcon obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So, what else would you do but then a high-speed travel through space while dodging and trying to avoid everything in, in possible sight? Yep. Um, like, almost like being in an asteroid field. Yes. I wonder if that'll happen. Ooh, Maybe. Maybe. Um, so they end up going to this planet, which is a refinery planet, um, to refine the coaxium. And it's raw, unnatural state. Like, like even just like kicking it could cause it to explode. Yeah. But refining it makes it all the better. Yep. Makes uh, it stable. Yeah. Um, in this case, though, the Millennium Falcon's also like been through some stuff. It's badly damaged. Uh, Lando's not getting out of this nicely. Yeah. And he just decides, like, "F you all, I'm leaving," and leaves. Yeah. Um, but we get back to the initial pirates that we saw back during the first job to get it. And we learned that these are not actually pirates. These are... Resistance fighters. These are resistance fighters. These are actually people a part of the rebellion 
and their intent is to get the coaxium to literally give it to their troops and their starships so that way they can continue the fight. So they can they can get to hyperspeed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and next comes this really weird part because it's kind of hard to explain initially. Well, it kind of, to me to me the one explanation that I liked about that was that you you figured out why the Empire couldn't get to hyperspeed and wanted to block people from getting to hyperspeed. Well, it's not so much that people are trying to. The, the, I don't think it's that people are stopping. I don't think that the Empire is trying to stop people from getting to hyperspeed. They lose them once people do though because yeah. that's, they don't. They don't have good tracking it's tracking yeah. software on them. Yeah. Um, but rather that um, it's their it's their coaxium. If they have a market on it, then less people have it. Obviously, it means they got to go can more through. Who, yeah, they can can go more through the empire, and you got to you know obey the empire more. You know, it's basically you know if you control the resources, you control the people. So, um, essentially, what ends up happening here is that Han and Han and Chewie decide that they're going to deliver the coaxium to uh, Dryden Voss and and. But Beckett, in the meantime, though, has kind of double-crossed them. Because Beckett's like, no, they gave the coaxium to the pirates. What you got here is fake stuff. And Dryden initially believes that. He sends his people out to go get the pirates, and lo and behold, the pirates don't have anything, actually. Han Solo brought the actual goods. And so, like, this big fight almost breaks out because, wait, Beckett's telling a lie, and Han Solo actually brought the good stuff but Dryden doesn't give two shits either way he okay but I'm uh, what confused me does Beckett know the truth well again they eventually, he eventually learns the truth when Han Solo explains no this is the actual stuff right you just he sent all your goons he out he doesn't know yeah he doesn't know in the beginning yeah he, he's basically sold out because Han Solo's listened to the plight of the rebels and, right. and the, of the rebels is basically and like, he's sympathetic to he's it. very he's sympathetic to the notion here at the end of the yeah. day well Beckett's not Beckett's very much like you know like oh you know, he's all for him yeah, all, you know, oh, all for one and one for it, one for all. It's such a Woody Harrelson character. Yeah, no, it's a perfect character for Woody Harrelson. I, I mean, but mind you, at the same time, like, I think if you told Woody Harrelson that he got to be a tree in the Star Wars movie, that he would have jumped on it. Yeah. You know, like, it, just as much as anybody else would have. Um, so as some sort of fight breaks out here at the end of the day, for stupid shenanigan reasons, I think, really. Yeah. Um, Hansel ends up beating Dryden for some reason. Um, oh no, Kira does. Yeah, Kira. Kira, Kira beats up, beats up Dryden at the end of the day, and she sent, tells Han Solo, Han Solo, go get, go get your friend Chewie, because Beckett's actually run off with Chewie at this point uh, under duress with the coaxium. Yeah. With the intention that he's going to hold Chewie hostage until he can offload the this coaxium and like get somewhere else for his own safety. Um, so Han Solo basically goes and gets them while. Beckett's literally monologuing. Han just shoots him. And Woody Harrelson's very much like, yeah, that's what I would have done too. You know, shoot he first. Ask does, yeah. Yeah. He yeah. Very, basically just like applauds him. Like, yeah, that was the right move there. Good yeah. job, kid. He understands. Yeah. I, I, I understand why. He's kind of his mentor. Yeah. Very much his mentor at the end yeah. of the day. Because you see a lot of what Han Solo would be in Woody Harrelson's character. Yeah. So, like, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, back on the barge, I guess is the best way to put it, the the, 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 casino. the, the casino barge. Um, Kira takes some sort of ring off of Dryden's hand and puts it into the stand, and you get a holographic image, and she's talking to Darth Maul, yeah. who's apparently in charge of the Rising Sun. And who's playing Darth Maul? I don't know. I, if it's Adam Park, which is the original guy, and not Adam Park, but um, the original guy who did it back in the original tr- prequels, which would not be a hard sell at the end of the day. This guy yeah. would love to work. Yeah. Because he's a glorified stuntman at the end of the day right now. Yeah. Um, he would totally do it. Um, that would be totally cool. He's got a double light. He's got a, another lightsaber suddenly. Yeah. Um, now, keep in mind, like, Darth Maul appears frequently throughout Clone Wars, the animated series. Right. So... Like he comes up, he comes up like every other. He comes up every couple episodes. I thought he was dead. Again, no, again, not not by not by lore. Again, if you like something long enough, it stays around. Okay. In this case, is this is like everyone liked Darth Maul and we wanted to see more of him, and so Clone Wars happened to be a good opportunity for that. And um, and there's even another series after Clone Wars ends. There's one called Rebels that takes place basically between this kind of void kind of space where. 
um, Empire Strikes Back, or excuse me, um, where uh, Revenge of the Sith happens and the rebellion is kind of happening in between yeah. there. So he pops up in there as well, actually. Okay. Um, so does Obi-Wan Kenobi once. So, um, All that being said, at the end of the day, um, getting back to our story here, uh, Han and Chewie basically catch up with Lando. The, mm-hmm. Now, the ship has departed with Kira. Was right. Maybe we'll see Kira again in the future. Yeah. Um, but Han has caught up with uh, Lando, and they play another game of Sabacc, and again, they yeah. bet the Millennium Falcon, Falcon. once again. Yeah. Um, and this time, Han wins because he's stolen the ace that... Uh, the cheating... The, the, the that cheating Lando party. would have had, and yeah. Lando's like, okay, well, you got me. Here's my ship. Um, and at the end of the film, they literally talk about, hey, I heard this is this deal we can do on... Um, on Tatooine with the huts, like let's go there. See, and that's why I thought, and, it, that, and that was actually Woody Harrelson. Like, that was Beckett's idea. That like, hey, I'm gonna go. Like, hey, let's get out of here. Let's go. I heard about this job with the huts and running. You know, we can we can do this job with the huts and get back even. You know, so like that's what Han Solo's and, gonna and, go do. And, and that's why I thought it it flowed right into New Hope is because it ends with him going to Tatooine. Yeah, but when we see Harrison Ford on, or we see Han Solo on Tatooine by the time we get to episode, uh, when we get to the first Star Wars movie, um, A New Hope, he has actually been, he originally attempted to drop off the spice, but because he got caught by Imperials, he had to dump the spice, otherwise get caught himself. Right. Um, So because he dropped it, the entire reason that Greedo is coming to look for him is because he lost the spice and is supposed to be paying back the huts with it. Okay. So the entire purpose, so what I really would love to see is I'd love to see another movie with Han Solo in it where he's got the Millennium Falcon and the the first bit of it is him meeting with the Huts and going and going to deliver the spice, finding out it's supposed to be going to Kira. Some shenanigans happen that he has to drop the spice because of Kira for whatever reason here to maybe like save her. And that's kind of his kind of redeeming kind of little aspect on that as well, maybe. Which is why I think if you had a second movie in this, is the actor is young enough you could still do Harrison Ford. Yeah. That I think it's doable still. I think it's I think I think at the end of the day it's still very doable. Okay. So you ready for my comments here? Please. Okay. So first off, look how long it took you to describe everything that happens. It's a long it's, it's, it's a little too much story. Yes, it is. It's, it's it it moves, um because it has to. Um, it moves it, really quickly. It moves really quickly, and and um, it leaves a lot of things undeveloped. Oh, I, I and I think that's intentional. Because to me, it's it's too much story to try to control. Too many things happening at the same time. Too many avenues of adventure at the end. of the Yeah, day. Um, and so it's it's just it's just too, it's just too a t o o o o o o o. Um, I, I, it's, I, it's, it's two. <laughs> I wager that there was an intention here that if the movie did well, that they could do sequels based off of it. It did very poorly. It did not do very well. Um, but I think it didn't do well because, again, I think part of the problem was that people... The, the Han Solo story before we get to A New Hope was not is really not all that interesting. If you take it that's on its face here, like... Han it Solo, actually makes other things uninteresting, which is part of my complaint. Yeah. So, so... It's... it's okay, it's, first, first off... What I loved about it, it had such a good love story. And I don't mean the one between Kira and, and, and Han. Which one are you talking about? I'm between Hans and Chewie. Yeah, it's a great love story. Like, this is how they become best friends. It's how, how they become best friends. And, and, and so it, it, that, and, and it, just one of those things where, where uh, it works. kind of wanted that broke back moment in which he said, I, I can't quit you. I can't really? quit you. Well, no, not no, not from, not, 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 to, not sexually. Not that. I, to, I but like this true friendless. Yeah, like, emotionally. Yeah, that would, it would have been nice kind of sentiment on there because again, because yeah. by the time you get to a new hope, like Han and Chewie, I got the impression they've been around, they've been with each other for a number of years, years at that yeah. point, which is why I think like Han so, Solo, so time has passed. Yeah. Okay, so I buy that, but uh, there's there's an, uh, a thing where where he, uh, I think Chewie's just so thrilled that somebody gets him. Yeah. And can understand him, and, and we're not leaving without the Wookiee. Like if that was a bit, if, if that was how, like if that was literally a line when they were leaving the Kessel at the end of the day, like Chewie wasn't there at all yet. Yeah, and he was literally looking at like Lando, and Lando's like, "We gotta go," and like, and, 
and Han's like, no, we're not leaving without the without Chewie. Yeah. And Chewie gets there, like, that's when you would have known that that was, like, that was meant to be. Well, so... Or even if that was just, like, a thing between the two of them at that point. Yeah. So, I mean, I I, I love that... that um because I think you see in Chewie a response to somebody valuing him. Yeah. And um, and, and treating him like a human being. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was sweet. And I actually did like that. Yes. On the flip side, I hated the love, the intended love story because it wasn't... So he does... He very conveniently finds Kira on the on the, on the barge, yeah. Yeah. After he left her way back... Yeah, on, just left. Just left, and and didn't know what happened to her, and and curiously, she ends up on this barge, and um, it's just in, too perfect in the casino. Yeah, it's a little too coincidental to be believable, and I thought for that reason, because it is too coincidental to be believable, why couldn't you have pulled that into the plot as something to to sort of a setup to lure him there or to uh, keep him there or to manipulate him. See, I was okay with the coincidental sort of nature of it because the, okay? because kind of at the end of the day here, like, well, I mean, they are doing whatever they can do to survive because they have nothing. They have nothing. They, they, they literally have nothing. They literally have nothing. I, I can buy the coincidental nature of it at the end of the day because if you really think about it, like, if for whatever reason, like R two D two and C three PO land on the completely opposite side of Tatooine and just get bought by somebody yeah. else other than like Luke's Uncle Owen, yeah. Then Luke never goes into space, never becomes a Jedi, and okay. the Empire, like, you know, the Empire okay. continues. Okay. So I, okay. Can, I, I can live with that at the end of the day as, as, a, as a reasonable kind of coincidence. Um, and I like where she shows up at the end of the day as well, where she's like... Was she talking to Darth Maul? Well, not even so much she's just talking with Darth Maul, but so much that she's like... Like, her, her, her allegiance is ambiguous. It is ambiguous, and I like that because, okay. like, who is, is she working for? The Rising Sun still? Does she? Really... You never ever see her again. Again, I think the intention was that to have more movies down the line. Okay, Cause Cause, cause it... because you're kind of left with that unfinished, yeah. and and then you know he goes on to Leia. Yeah. Well, again, my assumption was always that like there was, there there was maybe a second story that could have been told. Because this character is still young enough that he could be Han Solo for another movie or two, maybe. You'd have a little prequel. Uh, you have, like, a little series of Han Solo movies. Um, okay. Like, I, that was always my hope that that would happen. Clearly, that's not the case. Um, and I've seen... And we've seen lots... I've seen lots of movies um, where they leave the ending open-ended with the intention that, like, more movies to come. Huh. Okay. Because so, it is. It's left very much unfinished business. Yeah. yeah there's, there's quite a bit of stuff that's still not there. Okay. Uh, some fun. Okay. So, 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 my last comment mm-hmm. is: part of me was kind of disappointed that he was—he's portrayed really as somebody who's very sympathetic towards the resistance, mm-hmm. um, and and uh, very open to the rebels. Mm-hmm. But that's I, not necessarily the case that Han Solo was always like down with the rebels because he's not down with the rebels. No, and, and but but he's sympathetic and he. Um, you could easily see how you could see how he could easily be turned to the to the light side, mm-hmm. and I actually think that takes away from a new hope, because it would have much rather have have him had been a hardened, um, just a oh, hardened smuggler that like okay, in it for I, the I'm in it for, And again, that's why I think if like episode, I've, that's why I think like if you did a second Han Solo movie, that maybe in the process of doing the smuggling for the spice for the huts, yeah, that maybe he got in league with the with the rebels. For a little bit, because he felt sympathetic for it, and they burned him. Okay, so, because because that, I I didn't I I just it kind of it made it. He it, seems already sympathetic, so it doesn't lead into the character that he's in when you meet him in A New Hope. Because when he's there in you A New go. Hope, he's like, no, it's all, it's all about me. I'm sarcastic. I, it's you know, for it's for the money. I'm super jaded, and I don't believe any. You know, like ooh, this Jedi stuff. Ooh, ooh yeah. Like, you know, like he's like he, I can yeah I can. I think if you had a second movie where like he lost the spice and he got and he got really jaded because he was trying to help the resistance, like I can appreciate that more. Okay. Where he would lose his sympathy at the end of the day and really kind of show that, well, okay, well you guys have really effed me over, so f you guys in turn. Yeah. So it just so so that's where I was coming from. Yeah. Okay. No. Um, some interesting notes here. This is also the first film where Jedi are never mentioned. The Force is almost never spoke is never spoken of in the okay. movie and it's never mentioned. 
Um, it is in the next ones we're going to be talking about. Yes. Um, the actor who played Chewbacca here in this case was a gentleman named Jonas Sotomato. Uh-huh. Somato. This is his first movie um, in which um, he was portraying um, Chewbacca entirely because Peter Mayhew had done it in the previous movies. He did it in um, the uh, he did it in The Force Awakens, but didn't do it in Last Jedi at all. Okay. So this is the first movie in which the new guy got to play Chewbacca. The, Chewbacca. He's now the official Chewbacca stand-in because obviously, okay. rather unfortunately, Peter Mayhew has passed away at this point. Yeah. Um, which makes actually, when you think about it here, and then we'll get to it later. Okay. Um, Harrison Ford um, was invited to go to the preview, but didn't because he didn't want. He felt that if he went at the end of the day, that he might upshot the rest of the cast in their moment there. Okay. Like there would be too much of a comparison to him. Okay. Um, when um, when discussing the when they're when Harrison Ford and the in the um, when they're all discussing where to steal coaxium from, one of the places mentioned is Scarif which is a place in Rogue One where they're building the Death Star at. Oh. So there's a nice little nod didn't there as well. You pick that up. Okay. I, did it, I did it until I read the trivia as okay. well. All right. So, again, what did you think of Han Solo, uh, the Solo as a Star Wars movie at the end of the day? Okay. So so do I have to see it to, to go into the next movie now? No. Was it kind of fun to... to um, to see it, to see kind of what all this stuff was all about, kind of, and 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 maybe why he's so sort of um, Ro- roguish, maybe a little well, and, and tough shelled, and, and that sort of thing, and and kind of an interesting look at how we perceive gangs. Yeah, I, if anything, I like I like this movie because it helps build a lot of the additional world that's not the Resistance and not the Empire. Because yeah. um, I think when we get to later movies um, in the Star Wars canon, that I think that like. I think that'll become more relevant, hopefully. Um, but if they could continue doing this, I can see where it would go other places, because there are other stories to be told. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it's an unnecessary movie to add to the Star Wars collection, but it's not a bad movie at the end of the day. I found I, Rogue One more... more it's more substantial. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Rogue, Rogue One is definitely more substantial, but I find, I find the Han Solo movie... Like, if I never watched it, I wouldn't miss anything, but having watched it, I feel... Some of the luster on Han Solo, on Han Solo as a character is lost in the, in the shuffle. Yep. But like at the end of the day, like I also get like this great bromance with Chewie and Han Solo, and I get to see Will. Her- I, and the bro the bromance charmed me. Yeah, and I and I get to see Woody Harrelson as a as a Star Wars rogue. At the end of the day, like I get to see that, and I'm totally cool with that. And I get to so see, reminded me of Zombie Land. And I get to see the guy that plays Lando Calrissian playing Lando Calrissian. Calrissian. Yeah. Like there's literally talks about a Lando Calrissian movie. See, that, that would be fun. See, because cause I think that would be interesting. Because he plays down the middle. I mean, he yeah. really does. Yeah, no, absolutely. All righty. So, episode seven, The Force Awakens. Yes. So, we originally saw this in the theaters. So, this is a movie that took the better part of at least 10 years before we actually ever got to watch it, or 10, 12 years. Because the last uh, real, because we had 1999 was Phantom Menace, 2002 would have been uh, Clone Wars, and then uh, 2005 would have been. Uh, Revenge of the Sith. So it took us about ten years to get a new Star Wars movie. Uh, this is also the point where Disney has purchased Lucas Arts and Disney and Disney and, now owns Star Wars at the end of the day. And George Lucas has stepped aside. Yes, he has stepped aside. Now, what I should say that even though he stepped aside, he actually wrote treatments for a seven, eight, and nine movie. I and mean, he originally intended to have those movies come out in two thousand eleven to start with. Yeah. Um so that while they haven't while they Diverge dramatically from what George Lucas originally intended. Um, there are elements from the story that can, that continue, such as the lead character now being a female. So, okay. So, um, so to start us off with Force Awakens, it's been about thirty plus years since the Battle of Endor, so it's been at least a good, good generation or two, maybe. Um, in the Without the Galactic Republic, or without the Galactic Empire here, we now have the New Republic starting to take form, but as kind of a power vacuum, the a lot of the former Galactic Repu- uh, Empire people have now switched over to a new thing called the First Order, and yeah. it's now the new big baddie in the universe. Um, the Rebels are gone, but they're now replaced with the Resistance, a new fo- a new ver- variant on it. Yeah. Um, and at this point here, um, just name changes really. Yeah. And at this point here, like Luke Skywalker has gone missing. He's disappeared. He's not, nobody knows where he is at all. And the intention right now is that the resistance wants to find 
Luke Skywalker so he can walk in as like the Clint Eastwood uh, cowboy and just solve the problems of the resistance at this point because it worked so much well in the last one. Because he was the chosen one. Yeah. Um, so there's this character named Poe Dameron who is on a place called a planet called Jakku, which could very much be a stand-in for Tatooine. Right. Very sandy, very du- very dusty, out in the middle of nowhere. And 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 it is actually Erg Chebby in Mar- Morocco, where, where I've been. Yep, uh, it was a n- nice place. Yeah. Um, but um, so Poe Dameron is caught a lead. He's been sent by Princess Leia, or now General Leia, to go and find out where Luke Skywalker is. Um, but in the process, the First Order finds out where he is. Um, and we get our new big bad guy, Kylo Ren, uh, who comes in and basically kind of like is the new Darth Vader, down to the mask and everything. He's got the mask. Yes. So how, does he, how does he get the mask? That's not clearly explained to me. He made it. He made it. He made it intentionally. Okay. So... Um, he's also kind of kind of cool lightsaber. It's very different because it's got a it's like a like a claymore almost. Yeah. Um, it's, literally, it's literally got lightsaber bits coming out the sides of it, and it's it's cackling kind of weird almost. It's not stable. It's really kind of a weird saber at the end of the day, but it's cool. Well, and actually, it's a metaphor for for him. Oh yes, no, no. metaphor. Yeah, metaphors run deep in this yeah. in this uh, movie. Um, so uh, Poe Dameron gets captured, but he leaves. He gives his the he gives his little droid this little ball droid known as BB-8. He gives him the piece of the map where Luke Skywalker is supposedly at. Yeah, because he's gotten that information. This is where Luke Skywalker is, and so he sends BB-8 off into the desert. He gets captured by Kylo Ren, um, and then the First Order learns that oh hey we're looking for a BB-8 droid. Um, in between here we meet Ray. Who is, is who is of all things? Can you imagine? She is an orphan. She is an orphan. Doesn't know where she came from. She doesn't know anything, doesn't have a last name. So Never so met her parents. Well, she's just known as Ray. She's known as Ray. She is Ray from nowhere. Who does this sound like? Okay, well, I know stuff. I'm not telling anything. I'm just saying. Mm-hmm. We got a whole hell of a lot of orphans in this What, what do you think? Oh, well, I mean, orphan. I mean, it's space. It was a giant war. Orphans happen. Orphans? Oh, okay. So... Um, that being said, um, Ray stumbles upon BB-8, which is this little droid, right. and um, basically says, yeah, I'll take you into town and we can see if we can find your master there or find you to get you to wherever you, the resistance you need to go to. Apparently she speaks binary, which is the communication sort of like beeps and boops that yep. same thing with R2-D2. Um, meanwhile, um, up on Kylo Ren's kind of Star Destroyer here, um, you get uh, this rogue sort of stormtrooper um, who, like, isn't acting quite right. Um, you also get Captain Phasma, who is basically a stormtrooper in silver armor. Mm-hmm. A lot taller than everybody else, too, but very much the... Yeah, that one's the one in charge, that one in the silver armor. Um, so this rogue stormtrooper decides... Uh, well, I, I just can't do this. We just murdered a whole bunch of civilians who did nothing, who it's knew a nothing. Female. Oh no, 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 no. Uh, this the good, this good stormtrooper. Oh, okay. Um, he basically helps uh, Poe Dameron escape in a Tie Fighter, and uh, Poe basically, you know, he give, the stormtrooper gives his name FN two one seven something, and and Poe Dameron's like, well, I'm never going to remember that. Finn, your name's Finn now. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I like Finn. Yeah, we can go with that. So now we got Finn, the former Stormtrooper. Right. Um, they do a good job of fighting the Star Destroyer for a little bit, but uh, end up uh, crash landing back onto Jakku. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, it's kind of a cool little bit here, like Poe Dameron loses his jacket along the way, but Finn picks it up. And so, so as he sheds his stormtrooper armor, he's just got like this black clothing underneath. He just puts the jacket on over it. He looks very natural in it. Yeah. You couldn't tell he was a stormtrooper beforehand. You'd almost think he'd keep the belt because that's got some useful tools in it, apparently. But... And he is whose son? Nobody. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm talking about the person who's playing. Well, I don't know who who plays him. Is he, isn't he Danny Glover's son? No, no, that's um, no, that's. Oh, I'm confused. That, that's uh, that's uh, Lando Calrissian. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. He's 
He actually, what's interesting, this guy has, um, John, John Boyega has a very deep British accent. But to do the movie here, they asked him, well, we'll do it in an American accent. And they were like, perfect, we'll do that. So he has, he has a natural British accent, naturally. So um, he meets with Ray and BB-8, and the way BB-8 recognizes him, he's like, hey, that's Poe Dameron's jacket. You know, he explains that, oh, yeah, no, we... He he didn't make it. We crash landed on here. I'm with the resistance. We gotta get out of here. Yeah. Um, the first order finds them essentially and decides, okay, well we're gonna come and get you. Um, and so they decide, okay, well we gotta leave. Let's find a ship. It's like, no, we'll do that one right there. What about that one over there? No, that one. That one's a piece of junk. The one in front of them explodes. Okay, well let's go with the piece of junk. It's the Millennium Falcon. Falcon. Yeah. Which apparently has been stolen from Han Solo at some point here and traded amongst other people and found eventually. Um, after literally going, so apparently there was a fight over Jakku and all these star destroyers just like crash landed onto the planet and had just been covered by sand over the course of 30 plus years. Yeah. And raiders have just been, smugglers and like scrappers have just been tearing them apart bit by bit over time. Yeah. And, and reselling the parts. Yep. Cause old parts are still, still new if you clean them. Um, so eventually they get to space here after getting away from the empire um, and they find Chewie and Han on another ship. And uh, Chewie and Han basically take back the Millennium Falcon and decide, okay, well, let's get you let's get you to the Resistance. Sure, I'll help you out here. Um, but along the way, you hear that, um, you know, Ray and Finn are very much, you're with the, re- you're the Han Solo? The Han Solo. It's like, yeah. you know, you're General Solo? Like, you, you made the Kessel Run in 14 parsecs. I know, 12. You know, um, even for like Han Solo, it's like, oh, being on the Millennium Falcon, this is very, very nostalgic. Almost like he's like barely, he's like almost surprised. Like I never thought I'd be on here again. Um, meanwhile, back on with, uh, Kylo Ren, Mm -hmm. he's talking with his, uh, boss, the Supreme Leader Snoke, um, who apparently is also some sort of Sith of some kind, some sort of force sensitive being as well. It's not initially explained very much in that initial movie, but um, like he does make a point of saying, like, well, we need to finish your training, Kylo Ren. Yeah. Um, Han Solo and uh, Han Solo, the Millennium Falcon crew, let's call them here, get to this planet, which has got, like, a cantina on it. They meet um, this weird little alien, weird little alien that, like, knows Han Solo very well, and it's like, you know, what the hell are you doing here? Um... John Boyega's That's character. a cute scene. It really is. Like it's, it, it, it does hark back to the original scene where you go through the cantina and you see all these weird aliens kind of looking yeah, around. Yeah, it, I thought it was kind of a nice callback to, to well, it's a, nice a New tra- Hope. It's a nice yeah. tracking shot, too, because it's almost entire like, tracking throughout the entire yeah. thing. Yeah. A lot of also very um, uh, practical puppets as well, too. Not a lot of CG in there uh, for very minimal elements of yeah. it. You get to... Um, Finn's basically decided, you know, he needs to get away from the First Order. He comes clean and says, I'm not a part of the Resistance. I, I really just don't want to be anywhere near the First Order. I got to get away. So he's yeah. going to join up with a another crew who, who will help him. Okay. Just get yeah. off plan. They're just looking for people. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Han Solo's basically told Rey, because she's like a technological genius. It's like, hey, if you want a part of my crew, you can you can, you can stay here if you want. Basically willing to be her dad at a certain level, and she's like, "No, I got to get back to Jakku." She's always about getting back to Jakku, Jakku yeah, because her parents are going to pick her up on Jakku. They're going to come she back. She doesn't know her. who her parents are. No, she doesn't. Well, she doesn't remember because she got dropped off when she's like four years old, maybe. Yeah, and it's been like let's say fifteen years or fifteen or so years, maybe. Yeah. You know, I I'm assuming Ray is like. 17, 18, maybe 19 years yeah, old. Yeah, like, and I think you're right. Yeah, somewhere in that neighborhood, like 18, yeah. 19 years old. Um, the First Order, uh, not quite yet, but um, Ray hears something. She doesn't know what she hears, but she hears voices from a, from somewhere, and she stumbles upon Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. Accidentally. Which, is, which was originally Anakin's lightsaber. Right. This is the one that um, Obi-Wan took from... Anakin on Mustafar when he got burned. It's the one that uh, Luke Skywalker had until he got disarmed. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You still remember my favorite joke about tauntauns, right? What's the best temperature for a tauntaun? Lukewarm. Very cool. 
Um, and she picks up the lightsaber and she has like a trippy vision. And if you listen throughout the, throughout it here, you will hear the various voices of other Jedi kind of speaking about the Force. You will hear Alec Guinness, you will hear Ewan McGregor, you will hear uh, Mark Hamill, you will hear Darth Vader, Anakin Skywalker, Yoda. You will, Yoda. You'll hear a lot of different voices. I think Samuel Jackson's in there as well at one point. Yeah. So you hear all these variety of voices kind of over the over the course of listening through it. And she just hears them and she has really no context for it. No, and she's actually kind of envisioning, she's actually seeing a lot of like, random stuff along the way too like she sees yeah. the hallway from Empire Strikes Back yeah, yeah. she sees like Kylo Ren with a bunch of other people which are dubbed the Knights of Ren it's supposed to be like Ren Kylo Ren's like acolytes I guess yeah um, but you also get um, a vision of a Jedi temple burning down with like Luke Skywalker's hand kind of on R2-D2 kind of holding him almost like propping him almost like keeping him steady yeah yeah um, and after it breaks here, like she runs away from the lightsaber. She wants nothing to do with that lightsaber. Yeah. Finn see Finn goes and picks up the lightsaber. Uh, or um the weird alien chick, and I can never remember her name off the top of my head. Uh she picks up the lightsaber and um she basically gives it to Finn because the first order is attacking the Cantina. Other aliens are there and they have noticed Han Solo and the BB-8 droid, because it's gotten around that, hey, we're looking for this. Yeah. And they've let them they've let it be known that where it is. Yeah. Um, one side, and so the First Order comes down, you get all these cool stormtroopers. Um, apparently, D Daniel Craig, which is the current James Bond, mm -hmm. um, is an extra as a stormtrooper. As are, I believe, Prince Harry and uh, Prince William. Yes. Actually, another cool little bit here, if just as a tangent here. So, um, Oscar, I, uh, Oscar Isaacs, which is the guy who plays Poe Dameron, uh -huh. his uncle's apparently a huge fan of Star Wars, and so um, he asked J.J. Abrams, who was the director, he was like, hey, can I have my uncle visit the set one day? Yeah. He's like, yeah, sure. And while he was there on the set, like, J.J. Abrams went to him and was like, hey, you want to be an extra? And so he got to be an extra on Jakku in, the, in that first opening scene with his nephew. That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, like, how often, how cool is that? Um, so there's that. So yeah, like a bunch of like, um, apparently like a bunch of other people were there, like Kevin Smith, who's a well-known kind of like, uh, yeah, I'm a Kevin Smith fan. Yeah. He was there. Um, but they very much had to put up posters everywhere. It was like, you know, like don't talk about the movie. And he was like, okay, all right. Not going to say anything. Yeah, um, he would respect that. He's a director himself. So. Yeah. But, but he's been known to have loose lips about stuff, about oh, productions okay. before. So, okay. so with, with reasonable justification for it. Um, so there's a introduction where you think Finn is going to have the be the one with the lightsaber for a while, because he actually uses it with the Jedi with the stormtrooper for a while, and is yeah. actually like not half bad with it. Yeah, there's uh, some talent there. Yeah, um, there's a kind of a funny scene where Han Solo gets Chewie's uh, bowcaster and shoots, and is like, "I gotta get me one of these." Like, really, you've never traded guns before? Yeah. So. Um, Eventually, um, the resistance comes down and they they beat back the the first order, but not before Kylo Ren, who has come down himself to come collect the BB-8 unit, figures out, no, no, Ray's actually seen the map. Great, we'll take Ray instead. I like her instead. She's a she's you know she seems something different about her. Um, so Kylo, so we also get reintroduced to Princess Leia or General Leia now. Well, it's so hard to talk about this movie knowing what the next movie is. Yeah. It makes it difficult for okay. me. No, go no, go ahead. Go so, ahead. Um, I'm just I'm just say. So um, the Millennium Falcon crew travel with Prince Leia back to where the Resistance base is. Meanwhile, Kylo Ren has got Rey, and he's trying to probe her mind using the Force, and is not getting very far with it because she's apparently Force sensitive. She could be a Jedi, and so the notion is that bring her to Snow, can Snow pull? convince her to join the dark side you'll have another you know force and and, and he is really kind of now the emperor yeah Snoke's kind of the emperor here at this point he's known as the supreme commander yeah nobody's really quite sure where the first order came from at all so much as that like it just came out of somewhere and Snoke was apparently leading it well you have to have a bad guy and and to me it's just like a yeah. different name for the bad guy yeah but we'll talk about we'll talk about more I think we'll talk about more about Snoke here in the next in the next episode okay um so basically, on 
when they get to the resistance base here, they basically explain that where Ray is now, she's on a new Death Star, but it's not uh, the size of a moon, it's the size of a planet now. And it's powered by eating a literal star and regurgitating its power to multiple planets at once. It actually uses the uses it once to kind of show that the First Order is taking command. It takes it destroys the planet where the new um, New Republic is at, and a couple other planets kind of along the way. So you know they mean t- they you know they mean business. You know, you know to be afraid. Yeah. Um, so basically, Finn kind of convinces everybody, like, yeah, I know I know what to do here. We'll, we'll turn off the shield generators, which allow these, um, will allow X-Wings to kind of come in and destroy it, just like you did the Death Star. There's a there's always a switch like that. Um, and so they convince the Resistance to go do that, and Finn's like, yeah, I know how to deactivate the shields and and stuff. So basically, Han Solo's like, okay, well, let's, well I'll help you out here, um, along with Chewie. Um, they get to the planet, and Finn actually admits, I actually don't know what I'm doing. It's like, I mean, really, really? You don't know what you're doing? He's like, no. I'm here to just I'm here just to save Ray. Him and Ray have got this thing, apparently. Yeah. Um, eventually, Ray actually figures out how to do, like, a Force uh, uh, Jedi mind trick, eventually, by accident. And she basically looks at a stormtrooper and is like, you're going to release me. No, I'm not. What the hell are you talking about? You, you will release me from this these bindings. Yeah, I'm going to release you from these bindings. It's kind of cool. Like she's just figuring this all out. Yeah, yeah. Without any training. Nope. Without any sort of training. Without any sort of like even any watching anybody actually do it. Yeah. Um, she escapes on her own, and and mind mind you, there are no Jedi's anymore because the only living Jedi is well, there were Jedi's in training, but they were all gone now. Yeah, well, we don't actually hear what actually ever happens to um, the other students. In theory, like there were other students beyond. Uh, see, Kyla. Now you're getting you're getting into the next movie. See, it's okay. hard to talk about this one okay. without talking That's about fine. the next. Okay. Uh, so eventually, along the way, Han Solo, Chewbacca, and Finn meet back up with Rey, and so now they're going to go find. They know now where the shield generator is at. They're because they've uh, kidnapped. Uh, Captain Phasma and now they got known where they got to go. Yeah. And so they start loading up the charges on the shield generator where they need to be at. And lo and behold, guess who's also there? Just happened to be there. It's Kylo Ren. Ren. And while it's hinted at throughout the movie that in Han Solo tells about how um, he mentions Luke. Luke had a student in Kylo Ren and Kylo Ren turned to the dark side, joined Snoke. Um, Leia talks about how she wants her son back. Yeah, um, it's very heavily, he- very much heavily implied, and I, I think they almost say it outright at one point. But Han basically shouts out Ben, which is Kylo Ren's. Kylo yeah. Ren is basically Ben Solo, right? Named, so, a, named so, after Obi Obi Wan Kenobi or Ben Kenobi at that point, right? So, so Leia and Han's son. Yes. Um, they meet on this like very perilous catwalk. I don't understand how people get on those catwalks like that. There's no but railing. You need, you need, oh, but it's always on a catwalk. Come on, come on. Yeah, yeah. You're just steadying on there, just like no, like nobody's business. Where you have to balance. Yeah, yeah. Um, a bit poor railings. Well, I mean, I, I, if there was a railing, I would understand. Yeah. Like nobody just walks onto that here, with, like with no no purpose or anything. Right. Um, but Han Solo talks about how he wants his son back, and Kylo Ren is very much about how he's scared that he has to. That he, he's afraid of what he has to do right now. Um, and we all think that's like giving up the dark side and coming back to the light and so forth. Um, and you get the moment which we all kind of knew that this was all going to happen because like we knew they were going to kill somebody off at the end of the day. So yeah. Kylo Ren puts his light, activates his lightsaber and basically kills Han Solo in the process. Um, Chewie in a fit of rage uh, detonates the bombs that they placed around there and so they all okay. escape. Chewie goes back to get the ship while um, Finn and Rey are are in a completely different part of the shield generator, so they go out a different way. And um, Kylo Ren is following them because he wants that lightsaber. He sees that Finn has his lightsaber on him, and he wants that lightsaber. He know he knows it belongs to to Darth Vader, who yeah. is his his, his grandfather. Yeah, his, yeah. But he also has like his melted charred mask there as well, apparently. Yeah, yeah. See, that's what I was trying to understand: is how did he get the melted charred mask? You, you go where you go where it was buried, and you just dig it up. Okay. 
I mean, like, I'm assuming the bonfire melted the plastic clearly, but not or the so metal. back to back to to uh, indoor indoor. Okay, All one right. would assume. Yeah. Um, I just that's what I didn't think there was a good explanation for, but that's okay. And sometimes you don't need explanations I, on everything. I, I know, right I know. Here, I, so. I you don't. I do. Oh, okay. Suspension of disbelief. Yes, I know. Okay. Um, Finn pulls out the lightsaber, but Kylo Ren is like also fighting with him with a with his own lightsaber, and Kylo Ren's basically like toying with Finn at this point. Yeah, it's very much because these are very uneven, uneven playing fields. Yeah. Like, yeah, like this is a guy who's trained to be a Jedi. He knows how to use a lightsaber versus Finn, who's just swinging it around wildly. And at this point, we do actually do know who his master his his master trainer was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we we realized that it was Skywalker. Yeah, so, it's Luke. Yeah. yeah. Um, so at one point here, like he basically knocks uh, the Finn's lightsaber out of his hand and basically just like sabers him on across the back and basically like practically kills him. It's like a good yeah. like katana swing across the back. Um, and he goes to use the force to go pull the lightsaber to him and it literally flies at him and past him and then Ray catches it and activates it so it's Ray's saber now. Yeah, they have a fight in the snow and Ray gets the upper hand. Um, enough that she can grab uh, Finn and escape on the Millennium Falcon with Chewie. Well, and what's interesting here is she is as well untrained, and mm-hmm. it should be the same uneven battle that it was with Finn, but it's not. Well, she's practiced with a quarter staff. Oh, big whoop! I know, right? This there there is a there is a lot of fan hemming and hawing that she's a. Now, do you remember the term Mary Jane? Or yes, Mary yes, Jane? yes, I do. So. Um, or Mary Sue, excuse me. Mary so Mary Sue. Sue. A lot of people have a lot of problems with this, with Ray in this first movie because they believe she's a Mary Sue because she just inherently knows how to do everything. Well, and, and is, the only, is, and the only, like, you know, like you get a couple of inklings that she might have the force with her. You know, mm-hmm. they they can't enter her mind. The force is she's force sensitive, um, and she hears the voices of the past Jedi masters. Mm-hmm. But it's not really inherent. Yeah. No, I mean, and you she's can, had no training. You can explain that she's like, she understands how ships work because she's literally taken them apart, and she can. In, and in that way, you know who she reminded me of when she was still on the on Jakku. On Jakku, was she reminding me of Anakin? The, yeah. Uh, in in uh, the first movie, mm-hmm. she is a speeder bike that kind of looks like a popsicle. Yeah. Um, so clearly she knows how to drive stuff. And she's self-built stuff. And, yeah, she's yeah. self-built stuff. She's taken apart ships. So I can understand how she'd be able to fix the Millennium Falcon and pilot the Millennium Falcon yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. Maybe, you know... Maybe... Oh, that was my complaint that we didn't mention in Hans in Solo. Whoa. How in the did... movie Solo was, how does a Wookiee know how to fly a, 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 a airship? Oh, Chewbacca by that point is 174 years old. Oh, so he's been... He's, he, he's, he's been had... around. Okay. Um, he was also, if you notice as well, he was also there in... Um, uh, Revenge of the Sith as well with Yoda. So, okay. um, yes, he was, and I do, and I remember actually thinking that was quite sweet. I just was trying to figure out how he knew how to. Yeah. Pilot. Him. No, apparently this is apparently this is Chewbacca's thing is piloting. Okay. So. All right. Um. At the end of the day, uh, Poe Dameron and his squad of X wings, which I don't like the redesign for the X wings. I really hate the design for it. Why did it have to be redesigned? Because you have to redesign them, you you oh. can't you can't stick with anything classic or new. I I would almost rather they got a new thing. Okay. Instead of an X wing, have something like completely new and different. You know, like I I would have I would have appreciated that more maybe. I like the X wings. I like the way that. They... Well, I like I like the way the wings pop up too. But these wings are um, as where the original ones had kind of like they split to like a V. Yeah. These are just like a single wing, and like they kind of like one half is forward and the other half is back, and then they go split. that way. Yeah, and it doesn't look quite right. They look a lot skinnier and narrower. They don't look very scrappy. They look, off, they look like they'd be off center. Yeah, they don't look. They don't feel right at the end. Yeah. Of it. And instead of having like the two, the four kind of engine pods attached to the wing, there's just the one engine pod now, and it kind of they they, they kind of like split as well a little bit. Like it just don't like the look of it. I I'm, wish they had I'm it with mess you with, there. I wish they hadn't messed with the X wing or. Or if you, or if time has passed here, get a new ship. Yeah. Get a new get. Have something in like the same the same kind of like lineage. Like instead of like the, you know, maybe the W wing or something or some yeah. or something along the line. Something oh, a W would be cool. Yeah, or a W or like the H wing or something like w something w new. Or something. Yeah. No, I get you. Yeah. Or. Okay. Have something different and new. I was would be my thing. 
Okay. Um, at the end of the day, they get rid of the base. Poe Dameron is using his, who proves that he's actually like a really capable pilot. Um, goes in and basically destroy helps destroy the the Star Killer base. They all return back home with Finn, back home to the Resistance base. So uh, Leia basically um, apparently Chewbacca apparently like abdicated his right to the Millennium Falcon and gave it to Rey. So Rey now owns the Millennium Falcon, Falcon, I guess, at this point. Um, and so she leaves with Chewbacca and R2-D2 to uh, to go find Luke. Because now they know where Luke is, so now they're going to go She's catch seen him. the map. She's seen the map, so now she knows where Luke is. And Leia, Finn, Finn and Poe, or, or Leia and Poe are going to help Finn get back together and put him and save him. Uh huh. Um, and the end of the movie is literally Ray holding out Luke's lightsaber to Luke Skywalker on this weird kind of like island kind of place, and literally just holding out to him, and Luke kind of looking at her, just like looking very similar to how like Sir Alec Guinness looked like when he when Obi Wan Kenobi first met Luke Skywalker, almost. Yeah. yeah. And that's literally the end of the movie. Luke never says a tire word in the damn movie. Yeah. So, and afterwards, what I what I thought was interesting was afterwards there was a lot of a lot of speculation about you were going to find out that that Luke was her father. Yeah, there, there, there was a lot of speculation. Is this Obi Wan Kenobi's daughter? Is this yeah? Who's, is this, who's, who, daughter, who's, who's daughter? Is this is this Qui Gon Jinn's daughter or granddaughter or something like? A lot of fan speculation about it. Well, you and, had to, you had to kind of think through. Okay, so who would have been young enough to have fathered her? And have her be the age she is. There's yeah. not a long list. No, no, it really isn't. I mean, like, if you assume it's been, like, 30-plus years, you have to assume... Or, is she a long-lost daughter? Did did it, Kylo Ren Is she have a, a granddaughter a, of some so, well, somebody's? Did, oh, she, okay, she, cause she, so she would we not have met, then, the children of, of, of Obi-Wan or something like that? So he had children we never met? Possibly, or... Maybe Qui Gon Jinn, who was a rebel in and of himself, like was also like had a side action sort of thing. Maybe he had a wife who had a child who had a who or, had a kid. Or or, like or, a... or did Princess Leia have twins and she's really Kylo Ren's? Oh my goodness! Could it be another like twin sort of thing again? Like who knows? Yeah, again, that's part of the problem here. Um, we also never know. Like, well, not necessarily a problem. It's part of the opportunity here. Yeah. Well, a lot of fan fecu- uh, fan speculation. Like, I really hope. That she's nobody's child. Well, aren't we I, I know, out? I know otherwise. But my hope was always that she was nobody's. That she was just another unique person in the force. Because again, the way they described, the but, cho- but it's inherent in her. But again, so but here's the deal: they they described the chosen one as somebody who was like just super strong with the force. Now, Anakin Skywalker was supposed to be that kid who was just amazing with the force. It's kind of explained in novelizations and other stuff that she he, he's actually kind of like a bit of a humunculus almost where like he was made like, he was they they found this woman on Tatooine and just gave her who was also a little bit of force sensitive just implanted a baby inside of her almost right the well force. because because she actually tells mm-hmm. Qui Gon Jinn that no he he just happened he just happened he, 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 I, he, I, Jesus. who's his father he, no I, he just he just happened he just he came just, yeah he yeah. just came. And and so you know you get that sort of immaculate conception. I think that's why he, why Qui Gon Jinn is so positive that 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 one that he is the chosen, chosen one, one yeah. yeah, which would make sense. But again, I like the idea that maybe the person they were always looking for was actually Ray, who just happened to be nobody until they found her. And I would have liked it to just be nobody because again, as much as I love dealing with this entire like Skywalker well, clan, I mean, let, let's not let stuff go. Yeah. Let's not spoil stuff. Well, I, well, I'm I've not spoiled anything as far as I've known. Okay. But again, I, mean, I hope she. I hope. I hope she's nobody. Yes, I hope she's nobody because I was really, I was really, really hoping that she wouldn't be Luke's daughter because yeah. I thought that was just a little too too packaged. too perfect. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, and in general, before you watch the next movie, what do you think of of Force Awakens? Okay. So, um, and I'll make this comment about actually. Both movies, mm-hmm. both this one and the next one. Of the series, these are probably for me the two that most would not stand alone. No. Um, there's no way you can watch the next one without having seen this one. Yes, agreed. And 
if you didn't have the backstory from four, five, and six, these would be nothing. These would be nothing. Mm. And so it, it, um, I kind of always felt like, okay, so four, five, and six, could they stand completely alone? You know, certainly four can. Um, five did. a little, five a little less so. Six a little, and six a little, even more a little less, less so, so. As you go into that. But and, I thought one, two, and three could could stand without four, five, and six. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, if you never had four, five, and six after that, you would have one, two, and three could be their own series of movies. Be their own series. I, I do so, agree that seven and eight here, and then eventually you nine. Really, you do need to have known. I haven't what was seen happening. nine yet. Okay, so I haven't seen nine yet, but I, um, going into seven, and mm-hmm. especially having having rewatched seven because I did, I saw it in the theater when it came out. Um, having been a, a big Luke Skywalker mm-hmm. fan, um, really relied so on so many tropes that were in f- four, five, and six. Mm-hmm. It can't stand alone. No, I I do I do believe this is one of those movies that like I, I don't think you had to know all the stuff that happened in four, five, and six. But I think you have to have a good understanding of what Star Wars is. It's, yeah. So, it, it, or not even so much a good good understanding, but you need to have at least like, well, I've watched the movies once or twice before. I've, okay. I've watched these movies once. Or I I know what Star Wars is, even if, I, even if I don't know what, so which he, one's so Chewbacca. Here, so here, is, here was my question is, it came out in 2015. The movie that it really follows, I mean, when did, when did, did Six come out? Like uh, 90s. Six, six, well, no, no, six would have come out in 80, uh, 83. Really? Yeah. Okay. Because 1977 was the first Star Wars. 1980 would have been Empire Strikes Back. And then 1983 would have been Return of the Jedi. Okay. So it, it really relies on so much of the earlier story, even though there's a 30 year between. Yeah, almost literally a 30 year gap. Yeah. Um, it relies on so much of the earlier story that for the, there would be a large part of the audience who hadn't seen. You've seen those movies going into it, maybe. Yeah, and I wondered how, how they experienced the movie. I, I would actually disagree. Okay. Uh, because, again, you, you it does kind of paint that there are, like, it does kind of have paint in some of the numbers of what kind of happened in between then. But I almost imagine, like, had you not seen... The other movies here at all, like you wouldn't really, you know, like you might have, like you might hear the name like Darth Vader, but not really know what it is, and you could kind of go through the story because again, I mean, even if you didn't know what Darth Vader was, and and yet that's who Kylo Ren is is emulating. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not as impactful for you because it, you don't get the full story, but you can still watch it without having known that there's really? that okay. So I okay, so I just I, I think it's doable. I, I don't think you get as much out of it, and this is kind of where like. Part of the thing with Star Wars movies is, to, is that I have to remember myself that these are movies. These are movies meant for people who have a nerd kind of on a one to ten scale. These are people who are like a two, three, four kind of understanding of Star Wars lore. Like a one is not knowing anything. A two is like, oh yeah, I've heard of Star Wars before. Three is like, oh yeah, I've seen the movies. Four is probably like, I've seen the movies a couple of times. Five is like, I have a, I have opinions about it beyond just being movies. I I know I know enough of the lore to have issues with the lore. Like and these are movies, and that you've are, seen some of the subsidiary. Yeah, yeah. Or I've read books, or I've read Wikipedia. Okay. So I think if you were a one, mm-hmm. these would be hard to take away with a whole lot of meaning. Yeah, because, I agree. Because you really wouldn't understand what the force was, what those voices were that she heard, which are which are really, I think, important to the the narrative. I think they're important to the narrative, but I think, but not for the same reason. Okay, I think they're useful as. I think they're important to the narrative if you watch it coming from the older movies. But I think if you're a younger generation, like my niece's age maybe, yeah. you might hear those voices and you might look to your parents and be like, what are, what are all those voices talking about? Like, oh, those are older movies that we can watch later. Okay. So there are kind of avenues and options for later on. Like, I think it's like jumping into the book. It's like jumping into Harry Potter at like book number three when like all this other stuff has happened beforehand. And now I'm going back. Oh yeah, and I have to go back and read like book one and two. Yeah. But if you okay. had, but if you had read book one and two going into book three, four, or five, or wherever you started jumped in at, all the stuff there would be more meaningful. You don't need the time that you would need to spend with Hermione, Ron, and Harry. Like who these people, who are. These people are. Yeah, or okay. like the dynamics between or Snape. them. Snape. I mean, would you understand what Snape was if you jumped in? in the Precisely. Book? I mean, you may not understand it completely, but I mean, like, 
you okay. you can get enough out of the book at the end of the day to get the impression. Like, okay. you can go in seeing you see Kylo Ren is like that's a bad guy. That's a, that's, it is a, bad, that's guy, a yeah. bad guy. That's a bad guy. That's bad guy. I get that. That's a bad guy. Okay, so moving on to eight. So moving on to eight. Um, so the first order has found the base where the resistance. This is. I I got the impression this takes place like days afterwards. Yeah. Like, do you get that same impression? Yeah. yeah. I get the impression that like it's a continuing story. Like two days after this has happened, like the the Empire, the Resistance, the First Order has found the Resistance. resistance yeah. And they're making and they're making a mad dash break for it here. Uh, but Poe Dameron convinces Leia to let him go and basically. Pull kind of a prank on the on the on the first order here, like Commander Hux, and this is a character we didn't talk about in the first movie here. Um, Commander Hux, which was actually one of the uh, Weasley twins, yep, which is <laughs> amazing where he comes from, where where he's been for the last few years, but um, plays kind of this younger sort of head general of the entire First Order army, um, and he's just a little shit. Yeah. He's, he's just the littlest of all shits, but Poe Dameron basically, like, calls him and is like, yeah, I want to speak to your commander. And he goes on monologuing, and then Poe Dameron's like, um, yeah, I'm still waiting for General Huxley, whoever that, you know. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Like, he's playing around like it's, like, like it's one of the few times in which, like, I'm appreciative of the notion that, like... Lots of nice sarcasm there. It was, there's a lot of sarcasm in there, but I appreciate the notion that, like, maybe the technology doesn't work. Like, if you're watching that for the first time and you're like... Wait, is he? Can he not hear him? Maybe, or is that? Is it like a dropped phone call thing here? Maybe yeah. going on, yeah. like, like because to me that would still be funny. Like technology still has hiccups every now and then. Yeah. I like that notion that like even even in the future, technology is not perfect. It still has hiccups. Um, but basically, Poe Dameron leads a leads a successful, but ultimately very kind of um, how did I phrase it here? Um, a uh, rather heavy casualty sort of fight, yeah. Um, where the resistance loses a lot of its bombers and fighters uh, in escaping uh, the first order, um, and I- I'm going to make a point it here. Wipes out, yeah. Wipes out all these like bombers, which I'm going to make a point of saying these bombers suck. These are no Y wings. At the end of the day, Y wings were so much quicker and faster, and they could drop. They did the bombing thing so much better. These things are like. Well, and, and, and you have to ask, like why are they... turtles. And I'm looking forward to the next movie, because you have to ask, why are they setting them up to be in such a poor position, like the Resistance might not survive this time? So anyways. Yeah. I know, I will not, I will not say. Okay. Um, so they eventually are able to escape. They jump to hyperspace. Um, Kylo Ren is um, with... Commander Snoke on his main ship, and he just got finished talking with Command General Huxley, and Huxley looks very pleased with himself for whatever he's done. We don't know what he's done just yet. Yeah. Um, but Kylo Ren basically talks with Snoke, and um, Snoke's basically like, "Stop! Take this stupid mask off!" Yeah. And basically, like, you basically like mocks him for like the hell are you doing trying to be like Darth Vader? You're nowhere near Darth, Darth Vader. Vader. You are you are being such a petulant child right now. Like, grow up and get over yourself. Like, And this is part of where I think I think the his saber is really sort of an... An, uh, an analogy for him. him. It's very, yeah. very metaphorical for what he is at the end of the day. It's broken. Red, ragged. Red, and broken. Doesn't sound like a normal lightsaber. Doesn't hum like a normal lightsaber. Crackles. Crackles. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, it's not typical, and it's it's very much not right. Like even if you look at his lightsaber, it looks very cobbled together. It doesn't look like a nice lightsaber should. At the end of the day, it looks very broken. Yeah. Um, actually, interesting point here, which again is explained in Star Wars Rebels. Which, damn that animated series for helping helping out here. Um, the crossguard lightsaber is actually a very very old design. Like so that that lightsaber does exist. So Kylo Ren got the idea for it from visiting from old historical knowledge here, um, assumingly from the rebels that found it in Star Wars Rebels. Well, but who collects knowledge from parts of the, the Jedi world? Sith do. Also, I mean, I like I I like the idea that like after the war ended, 
Luke Luke for like ten for like five years was just out and about trying to rebuild old Jedi knowledge because for what didn't exist. He builds a library. Yeah, like he builds a well, library. Who trades Kylo Ren? Luke does. Well, then where would he get an old design? Well, again, who again? Like there is time in between here. Yeah, there is. I mean, there is. So, so, I, but yeah. we'll, we'll get to the, that scene yeah. here in a little bit later. Um, so basically, like Kylo Ren destroys his mask, so he's not wearing a mask for most of this movie. Um, we figure out like you know, Finn wakes up; he's been he's been asleep the entire time. He's been in a Bacta tank healing. Yeah, like like Luke did back in, in the day in slime, kind of. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, it's kind of like a. Um, and, like, and and there's actually a scene in one of the movies in which um, Darth Vader does that as well. Yes, in Rogue One. Yeah, it was the it was the time in which Rogue, apparently he could he was never in pain. Yeah. Um, so we find out that Ray is with Luke. They're on the planet here, and and she goes to goes to him, and he pulls the saber out. He picks the saber, and he looks at it cautiously, and then he just kind of tosses it behind his back and walks away. And then, like Ray tried to follow follows up with him, and he's like, you know, and Luke basically will will not talk to her. He's like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not training anybody anymore. Like, uh, I, I, I'm here to, I'm here, I'm here to die. Essentially, the Jedi yeah. are there's no more Jedi anymore. There can never should never be any more Jedi anymore. I'm the last Jedi. I'm the last, you know. Yeah. Um. And it basically, Luke explains. I mean, he he basically. Figures out that Ray's got something in her, and he says, "All right, I, I, I will do something with you. Let me yeah. try something with you. I'll teach you three lessons, and then that's it. I'm not teaching yeah. anymore because the yeah. Jedi, Jedi need to die. It's, it's, the, it's, it's, our time is gone. Yeah, our time is gone, and we've made the Jedi have made so many mistakes. He literally explains how the Jedi allowed the Empire to come about, which is you know." A, a nice fitting testimony to the fact that, like, the Jedi were dumb and stupid. They believed in a myth that wasn't true and allowed the galaxy to be plunged into chaos. And the, the myth chaos. was? The, the Chosen One. The Chosen One. Yeah. And, and it's the first time that they actually talk about that myth leading to... to uh, leading to their destruction, yeah. inevitable, inevitable destruction. Yeah. Um, you get this very classic scene where Luke's like, okay, here, sit on this rock. And if he wants you to feel the force, and Ray puts her hand out, and he, Luke is being, you know, Luke is being much, I think, is is being Mark Hamill at the end of the day, not yeah. Luke Skywalker. Um, has like this little leaf or something, and it's kind of like tickling. Ray, Ray's literally got her hand out, yeah. and Luke's kind of like t- tickling her yeah. hand a little bit. Do you feel that? That's the force right there. Oh, I feel it right there. It's like tickling my fingers. And he slaps her, and it's like, ow! It's like, you, you, you mean not like that? It's like, duh. There's, it, that's a great little scene, I think. It's just because it just kind of shows that, like, like even like Luke Skywalker's like, oh dear God, why are these people being so dumb? Why haven't we let go of this? Well, but he has his own reasons for, for feeling no. strongly that way. Oh too. no, yeah, no, he's got his own. I mean, I don't want to cut this down because it's a there's a large part of the boat of the movie here explaining how, um, it's what the, Luke Skywalker it's, it's is the, doing. It's the first time I get a reasonable explanation of what happened in the first place. Oh no, absolutely. Luke Skywalker goes about the point of saying that they're looking for their Messiah, and they're yeah. expecting their Messiah. So Luke goes about explaining how he was training Ben Solo. Um, he felt the dark side of the Force. He went to go confront him one day, but Ben Solo basically just snapped at, at Luke. Well, and, okay, okay. And, and well, took okay, down the let's, temple. Okay, let's. That's back. that's what Luke says. Okay, because because that's we not get that's not what actually happens. Happened. But that's yeah. what Luke says. Um, meanwhile, though, Ray's having this weird thing where she's communicating with Kylo Ren over she, this great distance. And she doesn't know why. No, and she doesn't know what's happening, but she... Occasionally, they like they see each other. Yeah. Um, apparently, like, Kylo Ren can't see... Can see her body, but not where she is. Yeah. But she can see him very clearly and where he is. Um, at one point, like, he doesn't have his shirt on, and she's like, can you, can you cover that up, please? Like, I don't need to see that. Yeah. I found that funny. Yeah. Um, eventually, at the end of the day here, like, Kylo Ren explains what happened, and Ray goes to confront Luke about it, um, and Luke eventually, after a little after a little bit of a fight, essentially, with, like, sabers and quarterstaffs, yeah. where, you, where Luke kind of shows off that it's like, 
look, I know what I'm doing. I can do this one handed with you with your quarter staff. Big, yeah. big effing deal. Yeah. Um, but Luke eventually admits that, yeah, he sensed he he looked into the future and sensed that dark future about Ben Solo. He goes to him in his sleep. Yeah, and in a moment of in a moment of panic, a panic and and distrust of his own self and his own student, he lights his lightsaber up and then realizes, no, what am I doing? I, I, I'm, I'm going to kill my nephew. I'm going to kill my nephew. And I'm going to kill something over nothing. Where. I have actually a chance to stop this, and like he, nothing's happened. He hasn't done anything wrong, but Ben Solo awakens as this is happening, and realizes that his the realize that his master is trying to kill him, and that's what pushes him to the dark side. Okay, so where I saw the analogy was very much Darth Vader, mm-hmm. and it's it's that thing of of, uh, of of you know the sort of Council of Jedi back when mm-hmm. having this kind of discomfort. About Anakin being about on the Anakin. council, and well, and and about you know, you know, I see I see darkness in this one. You know, Yoda's the most blatant about it, and and um, of sorts, Luke has the same sort of thing. He's concerned because he already senses the darkness, so he decides to to sort of enter. He decides he's just going to you know that to during, do the right thing right now is to kill his own nephew. Well, but to but, stop but, that. but but how he even even gets there. So he gets there by he already senses the darkness and he's concerned. So he goes into uh, Ben's uh, room at night mm-hmm. while he's sleeping, so that he can safely enter his sleep without Ben knowing. And he can sort of, uh, and that's when he finds out that Snook has already been talking to him and trying to convince him to go out else otherwise. Yeah. So that's how he finds out that Snook has already turned Ben. Mm-hmm. And he sees what Ben could become, but at that point, my sense is that that Ben's already turned, and this oh, I, or, or or close to it. I, that's not the impression I got. I got the okay. impression that like, well, like this he had is heard the final of, straw. Yeah, like like this was like Snoke had it communicated with him at this point, point here, and yeah. Luke. Said, I, I I imagine that Luke saw a vision of the future, and when he went to go look at his nephew, he he tried to look deeper and saw. This horrible future that would come out, and he decided, "No, I'm, I've got to snuff this out as, as the pinnacle of being like the ultimate Jedi. I got to snuff out darkness wherever possible." After he ignites his saber, it's like, "Wait, what the hell am I doing?" doing. Right, I, but I Ben, I can't do this. But, but then, but Ben wakes up wakes by that up point and doesn't, and just sees the lit and just saber. Sees, sees lightsaber without the full context of it. Thinks and that his uncle's going to kill him, and that's what forces him to go to the dark side, anyways, because maybe Snoke was right. Okay, but let's talk about what he does. It's quite the scene. Okay. Okay. So he brings the ceiling down through mm-hmm. the force. I mean, onto onto his onto his uncle, and he collapses the whole temple, mm-hmm. and he kills there like like other students there. Mm-hmm. Like when Luke wakes up, the temple is literally on fire, fire. and Kylo Ren, Ben Solo is nowhere to be found, and all of his students are gone, dead yeah. apparently. Yeah. Um, well, you don't see them all dead. You, you, it is littered. It's, it's, I mean, it's literally see, impli- yeah. it's implied that they're all that they've all been killed. Yeah, and you do see some. There are some dead. Mm-hmm. Um, but but there's still the library to deal with. Yeah, like the library is still there. Yeah, apparently there's enough texts that are still recoverable that he's taken them to this remote planet where he intends on dying and to safeguard them there. Yeah, you know, to let the last of the Jedi knowledge like disappear. Yeah. Um, so Ray decides that. She thinks she can go save Ben Solo because or Kylo Ren at this point because she's seen good in his heart still. She sees the light in the same way that Luke saw the light in Anakin. I or or so much as that, like even like Kylo Ren sees the darkness in Ray. Yeah. Like you know, like, um, and so Ray leaves to go save. Not unlike Luke when he went to go save his father. Yeah. yeah. And immediately after she leaves in the, um, which is why well, you got to wonder if they're not twins. I know, right? Yeah. Um, But then Luke decides, you know what? No, let's just get rid of, like, nothing good has ever come of Jedi and all this other BS. I'm going to just go destroy the library here. And he gets visited by Puppet Yoda. Yeah. An actual puppet. Yeah. By Ghost Yoda. And Yoda's like... Well, because he's having regret. He's having some hesitation about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and Yoda's basically like, okay, go ahead and do it. And Luke's just like... He can't throw the stick into the into the library at all to destroy it. And mind you, by library I mean like it's a hollowed out tree. Yeah. yeah. Um, with like stuff in it. 
Yeah, but it's, um, but it's got ancient Jedi Ancient tech. Jedi stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, but then Yoda basically kind of like moves a finger and basically causes a lightning bolt to crash down on the tree and set it ablaze ahead of time. Yeah. Um, then basically looks at Luke as like, like, you had every chance in the world. Failure is the ultimate teaching tool. You failed, yeah, and then you went and ran away. You shouldn't have run away, you know. Students are what becomes of us, you know, but better. Yeah. And Yoda kind of basically like smacks him up the head when I think Yoda really should have smacked him up the head earlier. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of like I'm. You got this sense that Yoda was very frustrated with Luke for for having bailed. But also maybe that like because Luke had cut himself off from the Force at that point. Yeah. That like maybe Yoda couldn't speak to him. Good. Okay. Well, that, oh, that's an interesting. Yeah, and that you know, I I get the impression that that was probably the reason why. Well, I know I like that. I like that because it makes more sense as to why nobody yeah. like. Because you would think that like, maybe Obi Wan Kenobi think, would have reached out to him, maybe. You or, would think, well, or you, Yoda might have, or maybe Leia. his own dad. Leia. Leia might have. Yeah, Leia would have been able Leia to communicate with him. Leia couldn't sense sense where he was. When he could have spoken to him. But they were point. connected. Yeah. I love that little through line for there. That that yeah. makes a lot of stuff make sense. Yeah. No, I like that. I so, hadn't I hadn't considered that. So, uh, meanwhile, not with the not with the Ray and Luke side anymore, uh-huh. but. Apparently, with Finn, Poe, and Leia here, like apparently, the First Order has figured out how to track the the rebels, yeah, or the resistance here, and they're now on their tail, and they realize they tracked us through hyperspace, which means even if we jump to hyperspace again and we're low on fuel, they'll still catch up with us. Yeah. So what they do do is they decide that they're going to just put the thrusters to the max. And stay outside of their gunner gunner's range because their ships are not as fast as their smaller, nimbler ships. Yeah. Um, so um, apparently they send out like a small little a little crew to go and attack the main capital ship, and they blow up all the main individuals, all the major people. They blow up like um, uh, Admiral Akbar and a bunch of other people, and Leia too. They get Leia. Yeah. But not yet. Leia apparently uses the Force. To pull herself back down to the ship and... Gosh, she must have been cold. Yeah. Um, and so in the... So what ends up happening is, is that um, the the next highest person in command is a person named Admiral Holdo. Uh, big, bright purple hair. Love that purple hair. I would like to have that purple hair. I, I, I think you could do it. I yeah. don't know if work would appreciate it, but it's yeah. doable. So the reason I don't dye my hair at work either. Yeah. Um... And her initial intention is that they're just going to keep going forward, keep, keep trying to call for help, but that they'll figure out how to get out of this. We yeah. have to believe in the Force. Yeah. And Poe Dameron's basically like, no. No, we can't do this. Like, you you got to tell us what, what, what our next step is. No. You, you gotta, have to take action. You, yeah. ha- you have to trust me. I know what I'm doing. And he's just like, no. You, you don't know I, what no, you're you doing. You don't. You don't. So... Um, Eventually, uh, he goes to Finn, and they've met another person named Rose at this point here. Rose is interesting. Rose is interesting, yeah. Very. Um, um, if the phrase SJW means anything to anybody, this would very much be kind of how a lot of people have described Rose. Um, very much hates the Empire for all the stuff that happens. Lots uh, of anger. Yeah. Uh, basically, they come across the notion here that if they can get to the capital ship and deactivate whatever tracking thing is following them, then the fleet can do a hyperspace jump and get to safety. Yeah. Um, but to do that, they need to get onto the capital ship, which requires a hacker to get past the shields for that. Um, so they go to um, apparently a very scummy place of hive and villainy, and it's not Tatooine's cantina scene. <laughs> it's like the nicest like Las Vegas casino ever. Yeah. And like... Vince it's, is like, it's, it's, wow, this is cool. It's Caesar's Palace. And, Ray's, and Rose is just like, no, this is the worst. Yeah. So, um, this is a part of the movie that drags for too long. Like, I didn't need this entire bit here. It was filler. Yeah, I very much, I, I very much feel like it was trying to fill something. Or, or rather that, I don't think it was trying to fill something. I feel that it was trying to, set, I think it was trying to have a message well, I was hoping it was building something that we're gonna. It was gonna be useful knowledge, useful yeah. stuff at the end of the day, and it, and it wasn't. Okay. And I were, yeah. it was very much felt like this is where if we had to have a message, this is where Rose's message comes in. Um, that is synthetic and, and yeah. yeah. So, 
Um, eventually, they get out of there. They meet their hacker, which oh god, um, Vinicio del Tormo. Vinicio del Tormo. Vinicio del Tormo, who is cool. I love Vinicio del Tormo whenever I get to see him on film these days. Yeah. Um, I love. Uh, yeah, no. So he's here. He's apparently their hacker guy. Um, he's very much in the same kind of vein as like Han Solo, almost like mm -hmm. he's only more, only worried about himself. Not a great pilot, or doesn't have a lot of ships, but damn if he's not a hacker. Um, he agrees to help um, them get into um, into the capital ship, but only because it's it has potential for him. Yeah, only because it's got other potentials for him. But um, apparently, there's a big reward for it in him. Uh, but he wants a down payment, which is Rose's little pendant. Yep. that she has for her and her sister. Um, in the end, they get onto the capital ship. They disguise themselves as Imperial uh, soldiers. We've seen how that works. Yep. It's worked twice before in the two other occasions that it's yeah, worked. Yeah, it has. Not this time, though, apparently. Um, meanwhile, Ray, who is, um, gets into kind of like an emergency pod and goes down to that same capital ship that Kylo Ren is on, gets captured right away. Um... And she gets um, tortured by Snoke to give up where Luke Skywalker is. Because the big notion is, oh, if we kill Luke Skywalker, then the I will have the nothing to worry gone. about. Yeah. The Force is gone. We have nothing to worry about. It's dark side all the way, baby. Woo! Ooh, yeah. Um, in the end, though, after he's kind of like done torturing her, like Kylo Ren is told to go kill her, and Kylo Ren kind of like does like a little tricky bizicky with. So Snoke has basically taken Ray's lightsaber at this point. Yeah. And has it, like, sitting right next to him. And Kylo Ren kind of turns the lightsaber 90 degrees and basically just cuts through Snoke's middle, middle midsection. It's, it's an interesting little little ditty. Yeah. Because it's just very sly. He's, he's just very kind of sly. You almost just kind of see his left hand kind of just moving ever so slightly. And you're like, oh, he's moving the saber. What is he going to do with the saber? He turns on the saber. Boom. And cuts and it in just, half and, and then, just slices him. Yeah. And then there's a big fight in this throne room with all the um, red guards there. And you get to see Kylo Ren and Rey fight these other guys. They're not fighting each other, but they're fighting these other guys like a teamwork sort of thing. And the ironic thing here is is that Snook is the one who sort of hooked them together. Mm -hmm. Who made them able to communicate with each other. Yep. And, and, and I never was clear with what his intent was with that we don't actually get to know what his intent was, was is that like yeah you don't even I know mean, where they, he comes from yeah so so i guess well we can talk about when we talk about what i liked and didn't like mm -hmm. all right so um after this whole fight and everything now, now mind you like ray uh, um excuse me not ray but kylo ren has been going through the point of trying to tell ray forget the past let's you gotta drop the past and move on to the future here we could be yeah. the future we, we could rule the world. We don't. There doesn't have to be Jedi or Sith anymore. It could just be us. Yeah. We we can control the galaxy. We can do all the good stuff that we want to do that we think is. Where have we heard that before? Oh uh, yeah. It's like a theme. People know how to do how to. Dar Darth Vader and Luke can rule the galaxy. We, we apparently mean, yeah apparently everybody else can knows how to do do this whole galaxy ruling BS. Yeah. Um. Uh, Ray disagrees. Ray doesn't want to go to the dark side, but she doesn't want to like. She wants to redeem Kylo Ben Ren. Solo, yeah. Kylo Ren, but um, but not go and join to the dark side. And in kind of this like tug of war sort of thing with Luke's lightsaber, they end up cracking it in half and breaking it, destroying yeah. the saber. Yeah. Um, but somehow Ray escapes. Um, now, if we go back to Poe and the ships and everything, um, they've lost ships along the way here because they're running out of fuel, essentially. Yeah. Um, the entire plot here is that they have like six hours before the entire fuel is out which is why they had to send Finn and Rose to go right. find somebody real quickly and bring them back yeah um, Finn and Rose have been captured at this point here Benicio del Tormo has uh, given up the location and information to the Empire here and has about basically uh, been a double crossed them yeah and he got a nice fat reward out of it yeah he's for himself mm-hmm um in the process here, Admiral Holdo's idea here is to basically get into pods and escape to a planet while they're still following the capital ships. Kind of stealthily go down to the yeah. planet, let the Empire kind of like disappear into the distance what they think they've killed the First Order and low, lie low until they can either rebuild get rescue again. or yeah. rebuild. Yeah. Um, Poe doesn't like this idea. 
because he doesn't realize that's what the intent is. He's a he man just, of action. Yeah, he he just sees them loading. You gotta up. move forward. He's a shark. If he if he doesn't move, he dies. Yeah, he he just sees them loading up ships and thinking, well, you're just gonna leave everybody here. Like you're just gonna leave the people. Yeah. No, she, like, Admiral Holdo intended to do that. Poe tries to start a mutiny when Ray and Finn or Finn and Rose get captured. He basically realizes that like. God, what have I done? I've hooked this all in for this one little bit. Yeah. Leia kind of shows up and decides to be his uh, force mommy and just stuns him and puts him on a ship and they leave. Yeah. Um, Admiral Holdo decides she's going to stay with the ship. Cap goes down with the ship. Yeah. Um, but if you need leaders, I disagree with that decision. So. I, I, do, I, can, I do too. Um, but in the process of Benicio del Toro giving away the, 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 Re- the, the resistance here, they start firing on those ships. And then Holdo does, um, Admiral Holdo does the, the most honorable thing she can do. She spins their battleship, battleship cruiser 100, 180 degrees, jumps into the hyperspeed, hyperspeed in like at point blank range, and just like shatters the fleet by her ship just like scattering into pieces as it. She is a kamikaze fries. pilot. Yes, and she, not only does she take out the main capital ship somewhat, she takes out a bunch of other Star Destroyers yeah. with like, you know, like. Flying Again, debris everywhere. At light speed, too, so it takes yeah. out quite a bit. It's it's actually, when it happens, like, there's no actual noise for it at all. So, like, you're kind of left with the impression of what the noise would be. Because yeah. we've never seen, like... Well, because you, you're in space. Yeah, you're in space where there's no noise, noise at all. Yeah. So, um, so eventually, Ray escapes. Finn and Rose escape to the planet that they're, that, every, that yeah. all the rebels got on onto. Too. Um... And so now the Empire decides, let's go just, we're going to finish off the rest of them. Um, but by this point here, again, obviously Stoke is dead. Kylo Ren now becomes the Supreme Commander. Commander. Um, and does... And he has to kind of talk his way into it, though. No, he basically just kind of like... Does it? Okay. He just kind of like basically just like abuses General Huxley over it. Yeah. Like if General Huxley just basically now at this point becomes Kylo Ren's little little punching bag. Like, yeah. Um, and, and he so goes down onto the planet to go in get the last of the rebels Ray shows up in the in the Millennium Falcon and um, basically distracts a bunch of the TIE fighters that were trying to attack the main base um, they've tried to defend it as best as they can but they can't nobody's coming nobody's coming to help them at all uh, we then um, and then suddenly Luke appears because Yoda slapped him on you know yeah Yoda slapped him on the head Luke appears, and Luke um, talks to his sister for a moment, then walks out um, onto the battlefield where all these, like, big AT-AT walkers are kind of, like, staring down on him. Uh, Kylo Ren gives the order, just blow him up. Yeah. This is his former master, just blow him up. They basically pummel the ground with laser fire, and Luke kind of gets out of there and just kind of, like, brushes off his shoulder a little bit, like nothing happened to him at all. Um... And eventually, like, Poe understands, like, you know, everyone's like, no, let's go help Luke, let's go help Luke. And like, Poe's like, no, no, he's doing that as a distraction so we can leave. leave. Let's, we, so you we, can we, get away. We, we, let's get away. And Leia's like, well, follow him. He's he's the guy in charge right now. Yeah. Um, and so the crew inside the inside the base eventually find Ray on the other side. They, they escape. Uh, Luke's still there with, Ky- with Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren comes down to fight him, and they have some choice words with each other and they have like a fight almost but they never actually connect sabers at any given point and until like until like Luke kind of like has his lightsaber up and kind of like lowers it down and Kylo Ren goes swipe at him and cut him in half essentially and finds out no he's just a projection yeah he's not he's a hologram he's he's not really even there and he disappears and when we see Luke again he's back on the planet but um, he was on that rock that he was training Ray on, and he was floating for a little bit, and then apparently all that work just kind of was too much for him, and he just disappears, he becomes a Force ghost. Becomes a Force ghost. Disappears. He just kind of dies right there. Um, and so, yeah, In the, the mo- same way that, that, that Yoda sort of disappears. Yoda Yoda's does, and, and yeah. Obi-Wan Kenobi does as well. Yeah. Um, they just kind of disappear into the into the Force. Yeah. And the movie ends with Leia kind of holding on to Rey, realizing that Luke's just died, and like, what do we do now? It's like, well, it's okay. We have everybody up. We have everybody already. 
we'll we'll figure it out. And the yeah. movie ends again, kind of on a sad note here. Where like, your your one hope you really thought with, with Luke is gone now, and the Resistance is basically the Millennium Falcon and whatever's on the Millennium Falcon all like dozen some odd they people. They have almost nothing. Yeah. So so okay. So oh, so that's that, so that's about it at the end of the day. Yeah. That's episode eight here. Okay. So so a couple of things you still don't know who Ray is. Who Ray is. No, we don't know who Ray is at this point. Where she comes from, as far as we can tell, she comes from nothing. Mm-hmm. I mean, Luke tells her, she, don't know. So where'd you come from? Nobody comes from, you know, from nowhere. Nobody's from nowhere. I was like, it came from Jakku. Okay, well, that's pretty much nowhere. Yeah. Which yeah. is, I think, again, I I like, I Mark Hamill has gone on the point to say that he does not like the way that Luke Skywalker was characterized in the movie. He doesn't like the direction that Luke Skywalker do was. And he's, that, but then he's turned around and said, I, I shouldn't have been so vocal about my, my, about, com- my, about, my, my comments. about my, yeah. about my, I shouldn't have been so negative about my opinions about it. I kind of see in the tail end where they were going with it now. Yeah. Um, but he, again, he was very respectful when he did the part and did the job he was supposed to do. He did. He did what he was asked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so things that, that so there's sort of a mother daughter thing between Leia and Ray. And Ray. But I think Leia is also like, Grandma to everybody else too. I think yeah. Poe po oh, in a lot of ways. Too. With, yeah, with, with I don't I don't know so much with Finn maybe, but yeah, like you kind of get a sort of a I get you get yeah, um, but very much with 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 Poe. Po, yeah, yeah. It's like you know, I'm. It's like mommy, please let me go out and fight the the, the bad oh, guys. Oh yeah, well, and especially especially since Poe so so badly as a person of action. Yeah, he really does need. If he's not if he's not in the action, he's like. I get into the action. <laughs> so, yeah, totally. Yeah, it's very much the old, the old. You know, it's like a shark if it's not moving forward, it's dying. Yeah, yeah. Um, sort of thing. Um, so, so. Um, I mean, I think the whole, the whole explanation of why Luke, because in in seven you get no explanation of no, why you Luke get goes. you get no you get no and knowledge. and 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 then you get this explanation in eight. Um, in seven, what you get is is Ray's vision. Mm-hmm. You, you, you get, do get a vision of yeah. You do get a vision of kind of what happened of like, the temple crashing down. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have liked to have seen more of whether I, I understand why it would be an eight and not seven, but um, more of what what led Luke to not be there anymore. Well, no, actually, more of of. Um, Luke takes Luke only takes on Ben because there's already some concerns. Well, Leia's, I, Leia's concerned. Well, I think Leia was concerned that he was a part of the Force and that like his Force powers might be could be his, could, could be. I, you get the sense that, that she knows that there's a dark a there's darkness, a dark element to there's her a son. dark element yeah. to him, and she sees it and she knows who his grand you know who who her father is, mm-hmm. and um, and so you uh, get the sense that that in even in sending Ben to Luke. To Luke, that it was, it was for the best because I know he's already going to be, It's already, he's not in a good position, but this is going to be for the best to hopefully Luke will make him better. Right, so there's already some concerns before that mm-hmm. even happens. So I would have liked to have seen, because because Luke already has his stable, as it were, created prior to Ben coming there. Okay. Sort of his his... He's going to train Jedi. He's he's yeah yeah, and and you don't really see what you don't understand what his hope is for that. What is he trying to accomplish with what is what is he trying to train Ben Solo to, to become instead of what to avoid? Well, or even the, or, or even the other Jedi's that he's training. I mean, the other. I kind of like the idea that we don't see the other Jedi because it leaves the opportunity for one of them to have escaped. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. It does. That maybe you could that, but like I think that like maybe a future movie might be like another faction of Jedi and Rey's leading her own faction of Jedi that somehow like these two factions of Jedi don't properly exist in the nature in the world maybe and so or I don't know like I, I like the idea of like one of them escaping and doing kind of the thing that they did in Rebels where like a Jedi escaped, and so... Well, I mean, I actually kind of had the feeling that several escaped. Or maybe several might have escaped. I, I don't it's know. It's not clear. It's, it's not clear. It's not clear. It's, it's not clear. 
So, so I actually had the feeling that maybe several escaped. That it, maybe it wasn't all of them. Okay. But, but, um, but it remind me of the the horrible scene with Anakin and the younglings. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And 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 I, I didn't care for that. Um, but um, what is what? So I guess my questions are: um, Kylo Ren is able to collapse the whole building, which seems to me like. He, he brings down the roof and all this debris. I think he brings down the roof of that small thing, small place that they were at. Right, but then, but then he's able. Then the larger temple is destroyed. Well, the larger temple is on fire when we last see it. It's not necessarily destroyed; it's just on fire. Fire. Okay. I don't think it's destroyed. I think. I think basically, Kylo Ren used the force to pull the roof down onto Luke. Um, cause I, I imagine that what they were in was not like an actual building, but just like a small, like hut sort of like thing. Yeah. Like everyone's got their own hut that they sleep in. Cause I th- well, but there was a lot of debris that fell. Yeah. Well, a lot of debris that fell on Luke. And I, I like the impression that like this house fell on Luke. Essentially Luke had to kind of like crawl himself out of it. And then when he got to, when he got out of it here, he saw the temple being, you know, the yeah, temple burning. Yeah. So it seemed to me like it, it was probably fear and anger and, 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 he talks about fear and anger, especially when he talks to when he talks to Ray. To Ray, he talks about about being driven by fear and anger. Mm-hmm. He it's almost as though he doesn't understand what's happening within himself. No, no, I and I, she's I, and she's in the same boat. Yeah, like well, Ray doesn't know what's happening to her because all this is literally so new to her, and she literally cries out that she wants somebody to help point her in the right direction. direction yeah, as we're like Ben at the end of the day, Ben Solo or Kylo Ren at the end of the day. Is very much on the in the kind of semi opposite path where he's very much of the opinion that like I you know I know what I'm doing is wrong, but clearly I believe this is the right thing to do even though I know it is wrong. So he's very much conflicted in a slightly different way as where Ray doesn't know what she is and she really wants a father figure or a motherly figure to help yeah. her. Kylo Ren is like basically saw. You know, well, I, I have to be in the dark side. The light side wants me dead, but what I know I'm doing is wrong, technically. Yeah, yeah. Which is very much kind of a like, which is why he very much wants to get rid of, you know, wants Ray to join her, join him because he's like, we can just create our own universe. We can, we have the first order. We can, we don't need the resistance. We can, we can recreate the universe as we want, and we can be the champions of that universe because it's you and me. We can do anything. Yeah. You okay. Know. So that and that's back to my my question that I started to ask earlier was was um, Snook is the one who creates the channel between them. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that they so that they're in each other's thoughts. Yes. And and talking to each other. And I don't understand why. Why? The way Snook describes it is that he did it with the intention that um, he expected he expected Kylo Ren to be dumb enough to to. He, he, he doesn't feel, really have very much respect no, for him. No, no. He feels the conflict in in him and thinks that if he reaches out to her that maybe that he'll convince her to come because he's so conflicted in, in and of himself. And I think that he's and, using... And she'll, and she'll want to save him. And it's the yeah. same lore that you had with, with Anakin and Luke. Yeah, like, like Luke thinks he can save yeah. his father at that point. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> I very much think that, like, Snoke... Lots and lots and lots of parallels. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, well, I mean, if you look at the original Star Wars um, movie, it's very much filled with a lot of parallels at the end yeah. of the day. I mean, like, it all... And, and George Lucas made a point of saying that, like, the movie was meant to be parallels to something else. Yeah. Um, like, instead of blowing up the Death Star in, in, in um, A New Hope, they blow up the droid factory here. Yeah. And... Um, you know, Anakin Skywalker losing his right hand is supposed to mirror Luke Skywalker losing his right hand. Yeah. Um, and um, the destruction of the Sith or the of the Jedi was supposed to mirror the destruction of the Sith yeah. in Empire in Return of the Jedi. Jedi you know, yeah. so like, like George Lucas had parallel ideas for that. Like the the same story kind of gets told, or several beats of the story get told again. So even again. though George Lucas is no longer involved, mm-hmm. you're still getting your parallels. Yeah, but I think we're getting the parallels not because of George Lucas, but so much as that, like, they're not bad stories at the end of the day. I mean, they're like, not I, bad stories. I, you kind of wonder, you know, at some point you, you're kind of bad thinking, cliches. Yeah, you're thinking, okay, is this a romantic thing? Is this a, what kind of thing is this? I get the, I get the intention there. I think 
the intention was to give it this kind of pseudo is this romantic is this not romantic is this are they soulmates yeah are are they soulmates or are they just you know are they just bosom buddies or are they just people that are just on the you know are on they the people same on team? the uh, yeah are they people on the fringe who who understand each other because they're both going through the same thing or the one or one side the raiders and the other side the 49ers and they're in the off season yeah. they get each other even though yeah. they have to be enemies yeah yeah, yeah. And, and 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 I kept waiting for some sort of some sort of um, while one while one lives the other must die. Not saying anything. Okay. So I guess I guess it it, it reminded me of of because it's very clear with Luke and, and Anakin while one lives the other one must die. Precisely. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And um, and and of course. Uh, Darth Vader makes makes Luke the same offer with together we can rule the world. Mm-hmm. Together we can rule the galaxy together. Rule the galaxy together. So, um, so so things I really liked about it. I like that they didn't answer where she's from. No, I, I appreciate that as well. Yeah. I mean, again, I and 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 I actually like the way Luke dies. I'm sure there was a lot of chatter about that. Well, a lot of people. So a lot of fans don't like the the eighth movie. And uh, I like everyone's got like just such these weird little contrivances why they don't like the eighth movie. Oh, we don't like General Hodo. She's being she's being too much of an SJW, which like doesn't I mean, social justice warrior. We're like, where on earth do you see that element? I don't see that anywhere. I don't see a social justice warrior, but I mean, she she makes the ultimate sacrifice. She's yeah, a, she's a kamikaze. Basically. Yeah, she makes a kamikaze. She makes an ultimate sacrifice at the end of the day. Like a, for whatever reason, a lot of people have a lot. One of the bigger problems people have with the movie is that Luke is not Clint Eastwood in this movie. He's not and like he's not that. He, for all that he's a central character, he's really not that central character. No, he's not. And this is kind of what I what I appreciated that like Leia and Luke are very much like mommy and daddy watching from the periphery and watching yeah. to make sure the kids are not getting into trouble. Yeah. And if they do get into trouble, they come in and they step in to save them. Um, and that's and that's um, that that was my thing. Like I, I I knew these characters had to be there because they, there's no reason for them not to be there at the end of the day. But I wish that these characters were in were not in starring roles, they were in like supporting roles. They were there to help lead the new place. Especially with Luke being like the option to lead Jedi going forward. He's the most obvious candidate for that because he's the only real Jedi that we that we have and he's the next guy to well, train any any and he um you know, he went out and and uh, and stored all that knowledge. Yeah, he went I out mean, and found went, all the knowledge and recovered it and stored it. I mean, he uh, has an explorer who goes, you know, on his behalf and goes and seeks. Or, saw, or he's bought, bought it back from other people. people or he's yeah. he returned to the Jedi Temple and ransacked whatever knowledge he could from there, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I love that notion here. Um, so he's created a repository for all this knowledge, all, all of which Yoda finally dumps. He actually doesn't. Um, there's a scene where Ray is actually goes to get a blanket for uh, one of the crew member, one of the resistance fighters. Uh-huh. You see the show, the kind of the cubby that she pulls out actually has the books there. Oh. So Ray actually took the books with her. Okay. So the knowledge still exists. The library just didn't have anything in it at this point. Okay. So Luke, Barry, Luke, not having known the stove, was going to burn down something with a lot of stuff in it. He's actually going to burn like an empty, an empty building okay. essentially. Oh, I like that idea. Um, I mean, a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people were expecting Luke to be like this, like the Luke we saw at the at the end of Return of the Jedi, but that's not actually whatever happens to Jedi when they get old. No, they I mean, become sort of counselors that that. Oh no, no, not even that. They can become homeless. They become like homeless hobos. Well, they become like monks, like de- yeah, like they become desert the, monks. Yeah, they become monks. But I mean, like the the re- the way I got analogized to it was like it's as if you went to. Um, what was the big concert in the in the seventies, sixties, or seventies? Uh, Woodstock. Yeah, it was like you went to Woodstock, and these were just people that didn't grow up. They didn't go back when they left Woodstock. They kept having that grungy. So they'd lifestyle. already hit, they'd already hit their max. Yeah, and, and they just stayed on a parallel. Yeah, line. they stayed. Yeah, they're basically hippies. Okay, so that that's an interesting. See, I see, and I think you know, I I think when when Order sixty six came. Mm-hmm. That was really the end of. That was really the end of the traditional Jedi. Yeah. And now all the now any remaining Jedi, basically, 
have gone off into hiding with the intention of safeguarding their own knowledge and themselves. Um, Yoda does this to a certain extent. He goes he goes to his self imposed XL. They all could, do. Yeah, they, they it, all do. There's not really those, a great retirement program those, for Jedi. We've never actually seen a retired Jedi at all. No. The closest thing we get to that is maybe you die. You die. Well, no, no. I mean, well, the, Luke, Luke of Source does. Well, the closest thing we get to kind of like a retired Jedi would maybe be the librarian in Attack of the Clones. Mm-hmm. That kind of tells Obi Wan Kenobi where like this planet, missing planet, might be. Oh, that's true. So, like, I like the idea that she's a retired Jedi at the end of the day, but yeah. we don't see any other Jedi. I mean, like, the closest thing we see to a retired Jedi beyond maybe the librarian might have been like Count Dooku, who was like, you know, Christopher Lee in his older age yeah. does a commanding job in that role because he yeah. looks like he's having a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but even then, as a retired Jedi, he still has like he's still technically a Sith with a red lightsaber. Yeah. It's not as if like it's just not as if he's retired so much that he's just switched teams and wasn't very public about it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So so I mean I guess um, I appreciate. The parallels in that, that yeah. like Jedi, like the, there's really not a retirement plan for Jedi. Yeah, so I so I appreciate how they how they off Luke, mm-hmm. and the the concept that he, he was for a noble sacrifice. That it was yeah, a distraction to let everyone else get away. To let everybody else get away because he just couldn't let himself let it in. Well, it's the mirror it mirrors what Obi Wan Kenobi did. That's true. He let himself get cut down by Darth Vader, so that Luke could mm-hmm. his former his former student. Yeah. And Luke allows himself to be cut down by Ren, Kylo, Kylo Ren, Ren, his former student, and, 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 albeit not in the same way. But I mean, like the parallels. It's an are very interesting similar. thing because, because and both both for distractions too. Because again, Obi Wan Kenobi did it so that Luke and the Millennium Falcon could get away. Right. Yeah. Luke Skywalker does it so that the rest of the people there can get away. Admittedly, it goes to the Millennium Falcon, which takes them away. Yeah. Interesting parallels. Yeah, interesting parallels, and and it seems a fitting fitting. He exhausts himself. Mm-hmm. He so it, it's. It, I thought it was an interesting ending in that Kylo Ren is the cause of Luke's death, but not the cause of Luke's death. Yeah, Luke is Luke is the cause of Luke's death because yes. he puts everything he has and exhausts himself to the point where he just he just cannot go anymore. He just he, 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 yeah. yeah, and and so Kylo Ren doesn't get the satisfaction of actually. Having killed, having struck down his master, but he essentially does cause the death of his master yeah. indirectly. Yeah. So I thought that I thought that was an interesting notion at the end of the day. Notion, and I thought it left it open for for something to be dealt with in the next movie. Mm-hmm. In in total, what do you think of those new prequels in general so far? These are kind of postquels, aren't they? Or postquels, I guess. Yeah. Prequels. Okay. Um, or, they, they're guess, calling this the sequel trilogy. It's a sequel tr- trilogy. Yeah, because okay. it's a sequel from the original right. trilogy. So. Okay, so the sequel trilogy. So far, mm-hmm. I'm back to my my earlier thing of seven and eight really require that you've seen four, five, and six. Not that you've seen one, two, and three, mm-hmm. but that you've seen four, five, and six. Okay. Because unless you've seen that, you don't get any of the parallels. Yeah, they don't matter as much to you. And it takes a lot of the weight, a lot of the meaning. You mm-hmm. don't understand the Millennium Falcon mm-hmm. has been around for been a while. Around, yeah, it's got to be like what fifty years old. They say the Millennium Falcon's actually over a hundred years old. Oh, cool. Okay. Although, well, I mean, the, I mean, they, well, that's what they say. Although they hint at Chewie is Chewie's still around, and Chewie's one hundred and seventy-five years right, yeah. old. So, give or take. Well, it's actually probably closer to two hundred now if you assume thirty years have passed since Han Solo. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, it, so um, so to me, it's it's um, to me, I, I don't see them as standalone. And you're probably right. If you know of Star Wars, you probably have enough backstory to get there. To get there, but you don't. But you won't appreciate it as much if you had seen everything. I think. I think you can go into the sequel trilogy, especially if you're a lot younger. Uh-huh. If you're like my niece's age at this point, I think you can go into there. And still enjoy it as if it's your own Star Wars, especially with my nieces being um, nieces. Though I think they can appreciate Ray being Ray, who Ray is at the end. I of the like day. I like that you have a female female heroine, and I've always appreciated that Leia was um, mom. Well, no, that Le- no, no, that, that Le- Leia from day one has been 
sort of a strong it was not your damsel in the stress. stress yeah modern woman and that dates back to 1977 with the first movie yeah she was never a re- she as much as she tried to paint her as a damsel in distress, she refused to be a damsel in distress. And I yeah. appreciate that a lot. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Ray, actually, the outfit that Ray wears in uh, uh, The Force Awakens uh-huh. is actually original versions of sketches that they did back in 1977 of what they thought Luke would wear if Luke was actually, if the character of Luke was actually a female. Oh. So, which is kind of interesting. So it went all the way back to 1977, almost, or well over 30 years, almost. 40 years ago when they were actually probably 40 years ago when they would have been developing the story and the look for it they took old designs of what if Ray if Luke Skywalker had been a woman this is what he would have worn on Tatooine and that's Ray's costume at the end of the day that's pretty which cool I th- which I found was a nice little kind of callback for that yeah um, this is also kind of an interesting movie where uh, Harrison Ford is uh, the only is the first uh, it's the first actor because again, Rogue One and um, and a Solo, a Han Solo movie, hadn't come out yet. He was the first non Jedi to get top billing in a Star Wars movie, which again is a little nod. It's also this is also the first time in which um, this is the third movie after Avatar and Titanic to actually break the two billion dollar box office revenue. But we ha- would have a lot more movies after that start breaking yeah. that pretty yeah. quickly. Well, in part because ticket prices went up so drastically. Oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah, know. Um, Porgs, the little weird things on the island with Luke. Yeah. Do you know why those are there? No. Because the island actually is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Oh, and, and you can't touch them. Well, not, no, no. They were actually puffins. Ah. Uh, so there were all these puffins everywhere, and you couldn't actually touch any of the puffins or do anything yeah. about the puffins. You, you know, they were just there. And so what they so what they ended up doing was they ended up creating these porgs yeah. to art out the puffins at the end of the day. Very cool. Okay. Uh, what I found also very interesting here, uh, the woman who plays Admiral Holdo, which is uh, Lena Durnham. Uh-huh. Um, there's a funny little bit here where everybody who ever has a lightsaber does the humming noise for uh-huh. the lightsaber when they swing it around. Uh-huh. Like, it's... It's almost um, accidental. You just do it naturally, even mm. if, you know... that They had to tell the actors in the first movie here, it's like, will you stop humming? We need to do this scene all over again. They'll add the hums in, I swear. Uh, when Laura Derner was shooting her blaster, she would literally go, pew, 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 pew. That's cute. And she didn't realize she was doing it either until, until like, they had to, like, stop filming. It was like, no, reset. It's like, why? That was great. You keep saying, you keep doing the sound effect for your blaster. Stop. That's cute. Um, Ewan McGregor also offered to um, express interest in reprising his role, um, but there just wasn't a place to put him in the story at the end of the day. So, okay. But again, in 2022, I'm hearing we're hearing a, a Ewan McGregor sort of Obi-Wan Kenobi thing. Uh, probably a Disney Plus, probably. I would like that. I would too. Um, so I think that's a good place to stop off here because we've talked for a while. Okay. Um, but we're going to go watch this weekend. We're going to go watch episode nine. Which you've already seen. Which I've so already seen and I'm avoiding saying anything about it. It'll be interesting to see what your reaction is the second time you see it. Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to all the smile details I didn't catch the first time, I'm hoping. Oh, I'm sure. Um, but no, yeah, so the next movie is going to come out. It's already come out here by the time we recorded this, so we're going to go watch it here this weekend and... We're gonna have our. We'll, we'll have a like. We'll it's a be, holiday thing to do. We'll have. We'll be. We'll. We'll be able to say that we watched. We'll be able to have a full analogy of the entire trilogy. We'll be able to have an entire opinion about it. And maybe express some of our our, our delights on where we'd like to see it go. Yes. Oh, I already I have. have I already have I, multiples I like to, of ideas of where things. Yeah, I, think I, should go. I haven't seen the the next movie, but so. Yeah. Um, but that being said, thank you so much for following us here today. Um, you can visit us at nerdtutorialpodcast.com where we show we're going to post we post all the show notes and all the episodes as well. Uh, you can follow our discussions on facebook.com forward slash nerdtutorialpodcast where we post uh, where we have continuing discussions there with a lot of our fans and people who are following us. Or if you'd like to reach out to me on Twitter at nerd underscore tutorial about any comments, critiques, or future ideas for topics, I always welcome them. But on behalf of myself and my mom, we'll see you guys again next time. Bye.